Order of Light presents A new era of contact UFO sightings and strange anomalies Secret space programs and off-world adventures Advanced technologies and new discoveries Extraterrestrial abductions and contactees Now is the time to speak as we explore the unknown, the uncertain, and unseen, we are the disclosure, and these are those stories. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel, all of you wonderful beings of light. So happy to have all of you here today. Today, we have a very special guest, and I'm super excited about this one because there's so many questions, so many things I have to ask tonight's guest, Eric. Hecker with Deciphering.tv. He's also here on YouTube as well. He's had a lot of, um, I wouldn't necessarily call them incredible. Some of them were, but a lot of different experiences throughout his life, starting from a young age up to his later years where he actually went to Antarctica. He worked in Antarctica, which is a really big subject, and I've never talked to anyone personally who has been there so i'm really looking forward to hearing what you were doing down there and if you learned anything new because i've never been there and i know everyone watching this they probably haven't been there so it's something i would love to hear more about and uh, we, we've been chatting for a little bit and uh you're from long island you know and i'm here in new jersey so east coaster in the house got to represent and I believe currently he's living in Alaska. So apparently somebody likes it where it's really cold and a lot of snow. So with that being said, Eric, hello, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here. And if you could, could you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're coming from, all that good stuff. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. It was, it's very nice to meet you today. Um, I've, I've heard lots of great things about you, so I think this will be a very fun conversation. They're all lies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess about about me. I, I guess you're you're kind of right. I've had a I've had a, I guess interesting life to say the least. We can say interesting, incredible. We'll fill in the adjectives. I guess however people want. Um, but I guess as you know, some of us have lives that are impacted from birth and just keep on going and getting more interesting. Um, I did grow up on Long Island, which we are learning is a, a treasure trove of oddities from things like Operation Paperclip um, with the OSS and Nazi scientists and SS officers being migrated over after World War II. We learn about things like MK Ultra, the Montauk Project, of which I was involved with those types of things. The gate programs in the grammar schools where the CIA and the DIA were doing things like the uh, eye drops with you know hybrid forms of LSD to help move us along into the right places they need us, us to go. Um, I did a short period of the time in the United States Navy in the submarine service, which was an eye-opening oddity in my life. Um, I spent time working on the north shore of Long Island, which people have no idea the wealth that is over there. Um, probably all of the heads of the, the U.S. military industrial complex, and I would suggest also um, the center of the American intelligence agencies since prior to the inception of America is also going on over there. And I believe that I somehow got myself involved with those factions. Uh, later on, I then did wind up going to, as you mentioned, Antarctica in November of 2010. I stayed there for 366 days straight um, and then got out of there. And uh, shortly thereafter, I came up to Alaska. I have been very fortunate to work almost all over this state. It's a large state. I've been very blessed to gain contracts or considerations, at least, that got me to fly around and see a whole bunch of it, which also 
added way more interesting and peculiar stories to the mix. So in a way, I feel like I'm I'm living almost like this Forrest Gump life of disclosure. <laughs> you know, like I can't be- I can't believe the places that I've been, the paths that I've crossed. Yeah, the people that I've had conversations with. It's just like you've got to be kidding me. Like here we here I am again. Like who are you? What are we talking about? Oh, you're in charge of what? Okay, yeah, tell me everything you know. Okay, I guess I can fix that for you. <laughs> <laughs> like Forrest Gump, I- I'm running. <laughs> yeah, you know. Meeting all these people along the way. Yeah, wow. it's like it's like so many times. It's like up. Oh, so, so there I was again at a top secret facility. It was broken. I fixed it. Oh, really? You know, like <laughs> and it yeah. just keeps different levels, but it just keeps kind of repeating itself. No matter where you go or whatever you think you're choosing, it's yes. like you're just on this path. And yes. with that being said, Eric, because in your brief introduction going over some of the things, we have to talk about each one, but I think the best way to talk about your experiences is starting from the beginning you know let, let, let's let start it in Long Island and some of those groups and projects you were involved with and then we'll move it along to you know other experiences then Antarctica and then Alaska because it seems like no matter where you go it follows so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sounds like a great plan to me so you know when when did it uh you know start for you and i know as we go through these things we reflect you and i were talking about this we Mm -hmm. reflect and we pick up on things we didn't realize Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. but growing up in long island a place filled with tons of stuff going on Mm -hmm. when was that you know first experience where you were like something isn't right here that eye-opening experience that you know something else is going on i guess if i was to say eye-opening like following the question in a literal sense i would say that would have probably occurred in the library in my grammar school on long island um during that that gate program whatever that cia dia stargate everybody likes to you know how old were you that would have been that I had that I had that I that I would say that I had the wherewithal in the question so the program I would say was probably going on for a little bit that I was involved in before I had the wherewithal the awakening um so I would say the the awakening was probably maybe in like second grade where I was like this is they're lying to us like I didn't know the truth right I knew that I was being removed from my classroom I knew I was going to the library and I knew that there was stuff going on But I knew that at the presentation from the adults to us children, I I knew we were being lied to. That much I could discern because nothing was making any sense. Like everything was so illogical compared to normal day life. Like um, I used to to think of like Bizarro World. I don't know if you grew up with Superman and Bizarro was like the opposite of Superman and Bizarro World, everything was the opposite. So I used Mm -hmm. to think of the library like Bizarro World. Like outside of, I was in a very regimented old school Catholic school. Like you do things, you do things correctly, or they beat the crap out of you. So yeah. there was right, and there was wrong. There was no, there was no shades of gray. Yeah. But when we went into the library, it was bizarro world because everything was wrong. Um, you know, when I was in the classroom and they asked you a question, there's a very definitive answer. When I was in the library, they asked you a question and anything you say is right and it's okay say whatever you want we're going to ask you a question and any answer you say is correct and i was like this and these were sense. like presentations like oh no these were these were, these were these were one-on-one situations at the point where I was one-on-one aware of in the library yeah. okay. one-on-one wow. in the library it's a, a i can picture it's a round table there's usually a, it was a cute girl probably someone in her early 20s that was the attendant and we were going through the Robert Monroe Institute's remote viewing protocols. So and it's without them explaining it at the time. I mean, at the time they were making it out like it was a game or something, you know. Um, at, there's a, there's a, a thing second called an grader, as they right. would with a second right, absolutely. grader. Let's right. play a game, 
see these blocks can you put them together let's go like it was a right. game wow right, right. Uh. so like that's why i said so like in my first hand experience as a kid right i had this memory of nothing making sense it's bizarro it's right but as an adult i looked into this stuff and then when i read what the protocols were the programs the processes and i went oh that's what we were doing Ta -da! Yeah. it's that simple like when you know you see the it would be like if they had me building a tractor and I never built a tractor. No one ever told me what a tractor was. Then everybody said, well, what is it that you're doing? I'd say, I don't know. We were doing this thing. We were putting stuff together. And I have no idea because yeah. I wasn't informed. But now after the fact, if I come across the directions on how to build a tractor, I just simply go, aha, that's what we did. Done. End of story. So yeah. now I, I know in hindsight what they were doing to me as a kid because I found the directions. Yeah and th that must have been a lot and like you said you were in second grade and when we're sitting in our normal class we're learning abcs we're learning vocabulary we're learning four plus four equals eight then you're going to this library and you're having these little ones on ones and just to piggyback and to the best of my knowledge i wasn't in any sort of program but I was one of the first kids put on Ridlin, diagnosed with ADD. I was part of their trial. Other than that, I remember when I was young, right around second or third grade, come to think of it, I remember my mom took me to this trailer that was on a different school's property. And it was on like a Saturday. And I went in the trailer and I sat down and I didn't do anything wrong. I was a good kid. I didn't know what was going on. But I went in there and there was a gentleman sitting there and I talked to him and I can't really remember much, but it kind of seemed like he was a psychiatrist of some sort, but I don't, I don't really remember anything. All I do remember after that encounter with him and just kind of feeling weird, but I answered everything he asked. Um, my mom, we went home, I remember her complaining. I gotta buy these Legos for you. He said, we gotta prescribe you Legos. You gotta play with Legos all the time. And we were poor and my mom couldn't afford Legos. They were really expensive. Yeah. And and I thought it was normal. And then when I got older, I started asking other people with ADHD and ADD. I'm like, did your doctor ever prescribe you Legos? They said, no. I'm like, oh, this ain't right. This is what's going on. And uh, it was probably that realization, right? When you reflected some, some sort on of this. A any kind of programs like this. This is like one of the angles that I'm coming from. I don't even, I don't even want to pretend that like what happened to me is happening to everyone. But what I do want to intimate is that something is happening to every kid, right? They're not letting, they're not letting any of these resources go. Every kid is going through some sort of a program or a process. That's the unfortunate reality they're watching hard right absolutely. every single one we're a crop we're some sort of a crop and nobody wants to admit it but yeah i mean we're, we're being treated that way you know we kids we are the to, future we, we do it to chickens and goats and cows we do this what yeah. makes us think that we are not susceptible to, to such an activity do the chickens know that they're in harm's way you know not, not my pet chicken. I have a pet but you know chicken. What I'm but you know what I'm do they <laughs> yeah, know what you do I, with their eggs, though? Do they know what yeah, you do with uh, their kids? I hope You know not. what I'm saying? I, what, I use what if, my chicken. What, what if it turns out, what if it's similar, right? What if on an alien yeah. level, right? What if on an alien level, right? The aliens are like, no, 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 I treat my humans fine. Thank goodness for all the eggs they give me, though. What if that's going on? Hybrid programs. I mean. Right? What if, <laughs> what if the kids are fair game? What if our eggs are just simply alien food and we're treated like well taken care of chickens chicken you know we're yeah. happy we get our food we get our little nesting box our little houses our little nine to five jobs and we pay our taxes we're happy yeah are yeah. we in like a human hen house and our kids are suffering it's just that's exactly why i'm so good to my pet chicken because if i'm if i'm this in this scenario <laughs> please have mercy but we're ants essentially yep. and and whatever's doing this to us they're ants to something else out there they're part of the rooster but 
I don't you know, know if you know this band Jane's Addiction. They're probably considered yeah. old school now. <laughs> no, I I know it. I Jane's know it Addiction has well. a great song called "We'll Make Great Pets," and it talks about when the aliens come that we'll we'll make great pets. <laughs> It's an amazing song. Yeah, I'm very familiar. Like Stone Temple Pilots, Jane Addiction, Jefferson yeah. Starship. I go, <laughs> anyway. Go. Uh, but um, so on, on a serious note, that, that must have been a lot. You were in second grade. You were a part of these little private meetings in the library, etc. Did things ever go beyond that? Uh, what was oh, yeah. the chain of events as you became older? What else went um, down? that would I to be completely honest it got bad it got into yeah. more of the darker MK Ultra stuff um, abuse uh, physical sexual we would be brought uh, off school property to a retreat house the St. Ignatius uh, retreat house on Long Island which has since been destroyed um, at the time that it was built it was the fourth largest residence in the country built by the Brady family and they were pretty much like the a largest. mansion like very oh, yes. big the fourth largest in the country at the time that it was built um, it had ornate scroll work of wood all around it with all of the standard you know Aesop's fables and children's stories it was built for the Jesuits as a home for boys um, and effectively it was an abuse factory it was um, we would get brought there in mass uh i would just say that the it, it would it would appear that many schools were showing up right the, you know you'd show up in, in like a, a field trip type environment so there'd be a few buses from our school a few buses from another school so next thing you know there's a whole parking lot with buses from all over and you said in, in in a in a mask and when you say a mask do you mean a blindfold oh i'm sorry like i didn't say I, i'm sorry in, i'm sorry i didn't mean a mask in in mass volume mass okay mass okay volume we were showing up volume like, oh that is i'm dark. sorry all right yeah all that right. would be really dark well in a way they were masking us through deception so it is like, okay they were masking us through deception because what would happen is we would show up right you know uh that you have the the teachers the faculty some of the parents or something that would be in charge of you know getting the kids through a, a, a field trip right but what would wind up happening to me is that when we'd be getting off the bus, lining up, you know, size order, alphabetical order, whatever they demanded, we would get um, a certain amount of us. Um, so, like, for me, I remember at a time period, right, we would be set into groups. And I remember at a time I was in what was called the Z group. And that was considered the smartest group. I was in the Z group. So, as an example, when we would go to one of these field trips, um, it would be common that... Um, one of the faculty or the parents would, you know, have a form that says, oh, the Z group, uh, everyone from the Z group, follow me. And we get split off from whatever everybody else was doing. And this was just common. So I remember that we would go on these trips and then they would say things to us. We'd get split off. And then our, I guess I'll just say handler, our school handler from the place that we came from, right? So from my school, they would then hand us off to someone at the facility. Oh, and wow. We would get our special tour and they would tell us like oh, you know you kids and, are smarter and you get and to that go. teacher or chaperone wouldn't be there you were correct we got handed to... off yep that's correct we would like just hand it over and then we would go as a small group and we would go um do other activities that had, had nothing to do with whatever the other kids are doing and i don't i don't know that they were treated well or not i have no idea what they were doing we got separated away how could you know <laughs> yeah. how could you know Maybe wow. they got treated worse than me, and I should be happy. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know, but they I would do take you off. And what would after you left these chaperones and all that? What the were they thing, doing? And this was this was actually interesting because this came back to me in a regression. Um, okay. the, the, the next thing they did, I, and it's, it's, it makes me mad saying it because I feel so duped. I think of myself as a kid back then. I get pissed. Um, but they would, uh, they had a tray, like a regular cafeteria tray with, remember the little, uh, like the wax paper baggies for like when you went to like a kid's party and you get the goodie bag to go home. So I remember they would hand us off and they would start, the next thing they did was they would hand us this, tr they would, we would walk past this tray and they would give us a snack and it was snack time. And I, I had since learned that that was, a, it was a laced snack. 
You mean the yeah. wax paper with the little dots on it, and you would no, 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 no. They, whatever it was, they'd have cookies or something in there that they were issuing to oh. us. They had little baggies of it. It was like as we were going by, they were like, you know, here you go, Z Group. Don't forget to take your snacks before you go in. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, we. But wow. Yeah, yeah. So because I think that's um, a lot of the reason why the recollections that then follow are exactly wonky shady and this is why i said you know as a kid i don't you know as a kid i didn't really realize but now as an adult well you know that kind of makes sense the whole you know we go on a trip it's hard to remember you know i but perfect example to back you up that i mean completely different but realistic so people understand where you're coming from when i was about eight years old my family we went up to maine we stayed in a cabin my stepfather ex-marine one of his marine buddies they had a lot of marijuana floating around and stuff. It was a big party. Us kids, my stepsister, seven, me, you know, eight years old, we were told, eat anything we want. And her and I, we ate like three or four brownies because we like junk food. Well, it turns out they were pot brownies. And 30 minutes later, my stepsister and I, we were in the bedroom. We didn't know what was going on with us. We were just sitting there, Indian style, laughing at one another. Our parents said at seven o'clock we were both sound asleep. And the rest of the trip, I really don't remember, even though I have pictures. And mm -hmm. it, it's the same yeah. situation, except yeah. my question is, after they did this, when you were in that mindset, were they studying? Were they asking questions? What were they, why? They were, why were they well, doing this? I'll, I'll, I'll continue to the point of where I don't really remember anymore. Um, and it'll answer your question, unfortunately. Um, they would give us the snack. We would proceed to walk um, through. I can, I can picture the pathway down inside it. Um, it was a massive building. So it, it took us a while from the point where we were at, literally at the parking lot's edge, just getting onto the sidewalk. There was like almost like a, I can picture like this little, almost like a rain roof. Like a, almost like a bus stop roof thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Almost like a little, like a, almost like a little bus station booth was right there, like a drop-off point. And the lady had the tray. Uh, but from that point, it was a decent walk before we actually got around to the back into the building, up to prob probably like the third or fourth floor of this house. It was a lot of walking to get there. Big, massive mansion, um, absurdly ornate. Um, and then we got to a, this. <laughs> huge room that had these huge wooden doors on it and we were young children in Catholic school uniforms and we understood standard protocols and appropriateness. We would enter that room. I remember walking in with the boys that I was with. We uh, would get into the room and there were girls from a different Catholic school because they had different plaid. They were, it's a obviously a catholic school uniform but it doesn't match the ones from my school so these are and uh they had just the skirts on they didn't have the button-up blouses or their necktie thingy they were young girls in their undershirts and uniform skirts when we entered the room we were told that oh since it's so hot in here and it's okay since the girls already have their shirts off you boys can take yours off too and the room was kind of like a, a T-shape. So when we entered, it was like you were looking down and I could see all of the girls, but then it was like off to the right was the right angle branch of the T room, the T-shape. And in that section was a whole bunch of chairs and adults sitting. And real quick, real quick, Eric, because you never know who's gonna watch this. What year was this? This would have been in the vicinity of the mid '80s. This recollection that I'm having right mid now. Mid '80s. I would have put. I would, have put, okay. into, I would have put to the to the to the mid to tail end of the '80s. Wow. God, God forbid, there's someone that's watching this that was unfortunately in that room in that situation. As you said, the adults were sitting off to the side. It's hot, everyone, and. You know, we, we know with LSD, with it being created as the marriage miracle, you know, giving it to couples and its effects on, 
how they interact and love, but the fact that this is children we're talking about and not married adults. I've never heard what you just said before. Really? Uh, I've never heard that. I, I, it, marriage counselors, you can look it up. Uh, when I it believe was first you. Prescribed, it was for that reason, you know, uh, L- LSD, huh. and they would prescribe it because it would just cure people's marriages. They would love one another. They would want to touch and be on one another, but that that's too married adults the I fact understand. that this I, situation yep. with it's it's children is I'm, disgusting it is disgusting and it's making my skin crawl that you're saying it that it adds more to the intention of the circumstance that i was in Be, they knew this that's, before the 80s they were doing this that. in the 70s mm. so they already knew what it did and to put that unfortunately and poor innocent. Oh man! Yeah, my, that's yeah, my, my memory, my memory. Like so, now that you're saying it, yeah, my my memory basically fades out at the understanding that they're pressing us to get closer to each other. And as a kid, I was uncomfortable with it completely. Yeah. you know, I mean, I'm I mean, sure, I'm yeah, sure you know. the the girls were uncomfortable because you know us as little kids, we. We, t- we talk a big game, but when we actually get in a position, we're like, oh, we never... Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, yeah, I, is- I was, I was um, you know, I was not, um, I was not disinterested in girls at the time, but I was certainly not comfortable, no. um, even if I was in private with one. And this was with, you know, a room full of adults. What the hell's going on? Like, it was not... These are children yeah. with innocence, and... Oh, um, from that, and I, I know that you're keeping things mild because it is YouTube and all of that, and we got to be careful how we talk about these situations. But other than that experience of being put in this hot room and that whole situation and the cookies or brownies or whatever they were serving up to you, was there other experimentations going on uh, that that you can actually recall? Because it's so hard, you know, to yeah. remember. I have a. I seem to have a lot more visitations to doctors' offices in my youth for the purposes of um, EEGs and EKGs, and it's my understanding that this is also part of the program. Is that they need to test their work. And that's how they they check what's going on. Um, so whatever they were doing to modify, work with, train, um, there was some sort of a process that they could check. And I have a lot of memories of, of having to go get that done all. The time. Like you had a lot of just what like most people when they went to like the doctors to check up. Okay, temperature, breathe for me. You know, all right, cough three times, mm-hmm. etc. Yours was having brain hookups. My whole body. There. They put they put sensors and all over my entire your body. Heart rate, mm-hmm. things that aren't normal for you know this young kid. I, I yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the most the peculiar things about it, I, I remember they placed one of the sensors went on, underneath my scrotum on the bottom of my sack, and it was weird. They, they put I've them never, all over me, dude. All I never me. heard of that ever. Never Fair heard enough. of that. That is so weird. That is they put so all, weird. I had them all over my head, all over my body, and I always remember them being like, all right, we're going to put that one on now. And I'd be like, all right. Like, you know, I'm a kid. And I'm at the your, doctor's office for all I know. And, I mean, just to clarify everyone hearing this, now, I could understand if they were doing that, if there was an illness with you, if there was something wrong with you. Did you have some sort of disease that you didn't know about <laughs> never I'm a, I'm, I'm a pillar of health and that was confirmed when i got to the submarine service i am my my physicality everything about me my psyche valves i'm in the top two percent of humanity so so why <laughs> why why all and, and your parents weren't hypochondriacs oh our little boy sick he's sick they weren't like that like why did you have to have all these check it's oh man right. it's so weird it's uh and 
Oh, man. And was throughout this process, as as you went on, was there a point like come high school, did it stop or did it continue? Because I've heard some cases where it kind of cut off around high school and they kind of go incognito and they wait to grab you and pull you into the military when you turn 18. What was the situation for you moving forward and how did that go down? I think I think programs and processes just change. I, I think I'm still completely involved in some capacity, like we were talking yeah. earlier, that there's, there's some sort of road in front of me where there's a path being built that I seem to keep meandering down. Um, so post, you know, grammar school, um, I don't think anything stopped. I think it just transitioned. I look at my high school years now almost as um, four years of close quarters combat training. I mean, the neighborhood that I grew up in, apparently, I mean, I never really thought it was a horrible place in my own it's mind. Tough. It's I, tough. Yeah, I, just, I had no, I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea what my community was like until I left it. And yeah. it, it, I, I didn't realize the violence that was going on. I didn't know. It was just, it was part of life. I it's mean, hard. Me, it's hard there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, I just didn't. It's I, tough, I guys. Didn't, <laughs> we we were fighting everyone constantly. I I've, yeah. I've learned now that I've been in a harder fist fights with my best friends than most people have ever been in with a stranger. True. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> that was just the environment. And I grew up mm -hmm. in South Jersey, not far from Philly and Camden. Ah, real, mm -hmm. r real, real mm -hmm. trashy people, just like Long Island. I'm going to call it what it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, we we. We were lucky if we had a pair of boxing gloves and we would just go at it with each other with one glove each and we would slip and just let that other one go. That was fun to us. It's a I used to walk around. Environment. I used to walk around. I took padlocks when I was in high school. When if somebody left their locker unlocked, we had these big giant padlocks that were issued by the school. Um, they fit in my hand perfectly. I kept one in each pocket of my jacket so that if things went south, if all of a sudden I turn the corner, there's twelve. If there's twelve kids, and they got a problem with me, my hands just go right in my pocket, and those locks became my brass knuckles. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, next thing you know, I get surrounded by twelve kids. And what I learned from my brother is, you aim for the biggest kid. Yeah. You pop exactly. that big dude, you real fast, and you get the hell out of there. When everybody's shocked that you went for the biggest kid and he's on the ground, now you run. You yeah. had about 15 seconds to get a head start. Especially, yeah. And my mom, I, I was raised by a single mom. I was a redheaded stepchild. I grew <laughs> up in the hood. Yep. And, you know, and yeah, I was tall, but, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, that's street smarts. It's not just Long Island. It's not just mm -hmm. here. People, you know, Los yep. Angeles, bad areas. Mm -hmm. We get this and. There's a lot of love and respect that comes from fighting your best friends. Because mm -hmm. years down the road, you're like, remember that time we just clocked each other for no, it, it becomes our highlight stories. But um, you also, it's, you know, you're, it's just, this is, this is why I said it's close quarters combat training. Cause you're yeah. right. Cause you learn because now you know what your buddy's limits are. And when it yeah. comes down to, cause we had pandemonium as well. I mean, there were times where it's 400 kids against 400 kids. Yeah, and this is pandemonium. Like school, and you, and looking, school riots. <laughs> oh yeah, and you're looking around and you're trying to figure Trash out which cans. Which, <laughs> yeah, which which one of your buddies do you choose to help? And you know that by by going down this road with them before, you yeah. know. So. Wow. So um, yeah, a lot. And you grew up in this environment. You said it was always going. And be behind the scenes, you and I were talking, and you briefly brought up something that happened during your prom. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, this, this is an interesting time period for me because I'm certainly not versed in things, but, um, you know, lots of times in life, you don't have to believe in something, but you can understand that other people do. So I don't believe in the practices of Satanism, but I understand that other people do. Yeah. And it's my understanding that the number 93 is a very, if not the most important number in some of the more nefarious circles. So I actually believe that in 1993, when I was graduating high school, and oddly enough, was having my prom weekend in Montauk. Oh. I think this was also one of these events 
where um, there was more guidance in my presence than I knew at the time. There was, um, I guess I'll just get to the odd story because otherwise I could spend forever talking about Montauk. But this particular weekend, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's prom weekend, so I am not going to pull punches. I was annihilated. Um, <laughs> but I've been, I've been annihilated before. Um, yeah. And never had UFO experiences, so to say. So I'm, I'm not going to let people pull that card and be like, oh, it's because you're all screwed up. Well, that would mean that every time I got screwed up, I'd be seeing aliens if that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, 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 yeah. A lot of people get screwed up all the time and don't see aliens. So I, I, yeah. I think that's a, a major cop out when people play that card. Yeah. Um, I, I admit, I was a teenage kid and I was wasted on the beach with my friends having a grand old time. It's prom night. Yeah, it's dark out. <laughs> yeah, we're having, we're, we're having a party on the beach, bonfires, and we're having a blast, right? But then all of a sudden, we're, it's, it's Long Island. We're looking out on the ocean, and there's like light on the horizon, on the water coming towards us. Not way up high, like on the water level. On the horizon. Yeah, coming at us, but like from far away and like fast. So like in a way, we're like, wow, what's what's coming at us, you know? And we're wasted, so we're like, Wah! you know? Um, but as it's getting closer, it's really peculiar, because it's like, in my brain, I'm thinking like a, it's like a barge, okay? But in a way, it's almost like it's too low and too flat, too wide, too long. It almost seemed like, it almost seemed like there was a floor the size of a football field just over the water floating towards us with people standing on it and like some light poles some like strewn about like up like some light poles that would go up and almost had like lights shining down so it kind of just looked like everybody was silhouetted like back lit um, and it just looked like this thing was like gliding over the water and getting closer to us and it was like at first it was like kind of like we were hooting and hollering thought it was funny and then it was like it just kept getting closer and bigger and it got to the point where we like kind of stopped laughing and we're yeah. just like what's what is that so getting close definitely it's definitely going to keep coming like we at the point like it's definitely going to keep coming there's nothing stopping this thing that's not funny anymore and then it was like when it got really close to when it looked like it was like about to hit shore i, it, I woke up the next morning alone on the beach I was passed out on driftwood, and I woke uh. up to the sounds of little girls giggling as they were throwing stuff at me as I was passed out on this driftwood. And I, I was coming to, and I could hear one of their moms, I gather, was yelling at them, get away from him, get away from him, which is <laughs> responsible <laughs> mothering. <laughs> now, 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 my question is, so the last thing, and... It was about water level, like horizon, Absolutely. really coming across that. You said mm -hmm. the last thing you remember, it, it was just about to hit shore. It's just about to hit shore, up. and in my brain, I could picture like as if your I could friends. see that it wasn't touching the water. We were, we were just. You were right there, there with your friends. Did you talk to them about it? Did they have? Yeah. They recalled this. What What did they say about it? I, I think that I just remember that it was the next day because I, I remember giving them crap for leaving me on the beach. I was like, oh, thanks. And, but and pretty much every everybody <laughs> pretty much was like, hey, man, like we all just we all just kind of woke up and didn't really, you know, no harm, no foul. And I was just busting their chops. Like It's not like I was really serious. Yeah. Mad at them. I get it. You know, I was just busting their chops. Like, oh, you, you were comfortable. The you were on the beach. Yeah, I, was, I was fine. Yeah, I was, I was way comfortable. Um, <laughs> But we all just kind of laughed it off as like, wow, that was odd and peculiar. Right there, and, we were, right, you and know, it's not that, like, 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 yeah, and it's not like at the time that our brains were so prepared to be like, oh, it must have been the UFO. I think we were just very um, ready to wash it away as just weird. And eh, it's probably a boat, but then you know, let's say it was a boat. I'm sorry, these boats don't come to shore there ever, never. That's not a place a boat that doesn't happen. And your description and the speed of it didn't line up either. 
Yeah, you know? it's so weird. I can picture it in my head still. Nothing about the motion of it is appropriate. I mean, it's, see, I can picture it floating over the water like it's completely unimpacted by the motion of the ocean. Yeah, like like Just there was, especially over. when you're coming in the shore. There's waves. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just it completely just, smooth. It's con- that's completely all stable. Yeah, it's just yeah. gliding in completely stable. Ah, oh, that's weird. And I, and it I, wasn't I even get... like it was a ship. Again, I, the weird thing is like I'm literally telling you, it was just like a floor. It, it, it was like it was like, like a, a floor. dance floor with poles going up with so yeah, just like, coming across uh, the surface of the water. <laughs> and it wasn't a lot of people. It was just a, 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 maybe three or four people on this thing the size of a football field. That was illuminated from the top and casting a shadow out like underneath. That which big of... with such a small amount of people. It's weird. It's yeah, it so odd. strange. I love that you don't have answers for it. It, it was what it was, and <laughs> yeah. that, that's it. Yeah, I'm fine <laughs> with it being unidentified. I'm way yeah. cool with that. It sounds like an extraterrestrial dance floor that went in the party with this drunk little prom guy on Long Island Beach. Oh, like, oh no. yeah, we're here to party. Like, oh, was, that's so funny. It was a, that was an intergalactic limo from some other school that was hanging out in Montauk with us. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was uh, oh, the dark that, fleet, the dark that fleet party shit. crew coming there. <laughs> Uh, the, but that, that that's amazing. And the truth is, some of these experiences, there is no rhyme or reason. It, it mm-hmm. is what it is. I'm sure yeah. there is a reason behind it. But um, there's just some things we'll never know. And that, yeah. that drive has probably left you asking a lot of questions about that situation, about the experiences you were going through in your you know, elementary school, middle school, up to, you know, prom. You're talking about prom right now. So you have this crazy experience. You graduate high school. And I believe you said something about going into the Navy. Did you do that after high school? How did, uh, what went down almost after immediately. that? Yeah, so immediately. I think this is how the, pro- yeah, almost immediately after high school, I, I found myself uh, signed up with the United States Submarine Service. Wow. That was a, a very interesting time in my life, which was also extremely um, confusing in hindsight, because um, this is this is where I'm I'm very comfortable now, knowing that there is some sort of mind manipulation technology afoot, because never. <laughs> Never in my life have I ever been accused of having trouble learning stuff. I've always excelled <laughs> at learning. Yeah. Fast um, learner. To, yeah, to the point that when I uh, took the ASFAB and met the Navy recruiters, um, they agreed and were like, wow, you're a genius. Can you volunteer for the submarine service? We need a guy who's like, you know, the whole drill, right? You're doing really great on the test. You're so smart. Can we, volunteer for this thing. Oh, yeah, I'll take a look at it. So then all of a sudden I get into the Peculiar Submarine Service. I'm no longer in the Peculiar Submarine Service, but I somehow am stuck with the memory of being in the United States Submarine Service and more or less flunking out. That somehow uh, my entire life of excelling on every test and every class I've ever been in. All of a sudden, I show up to submarine school, I'm getting zeros. That's my memory. That's weird. So I'm not in the submarine service anymore because I can't learn anything. And that's your memory? That's my memory, which makes no sense. So so, so here's here's what my belief is. Um, Something happened when I was in the submarine service. Um, I'm no longer in the submarine service. They wiped my recollection, and somebody was funny enough to put a memory in my memory banks that doesn't fit with anything else. I, you, you failed out of it. And how long on the paper? Which, is, because which isn't that. actually effectively true. I didn't actually fail out. I, I was on my way to, don't get me wrong, according to my memory. 
But in reality, in, in reality, I still got myself out of the United States Navy. That's okay. the facts. I still got myself out. Um, so this adds to the oddity of stuff, right? Yeah. In reality, many... I signed up for the Navy and I got myself out. But in the process of getting myself out, I got myself out with a very weird set of memories that don't seem to match the rest of who I am, which I find very intriguing. Yeah. How many um, years? Because I, I know they can put those memories. Nine months or... that I was present. I Total. Was present After boot nine... camp or during? Total. Including. Total nine months. So three Total months boot months. camp, six yep. months submarine. Post. Yeah, submarine training, correct. Which it takes just about a good, you know, six months. You're training, you're on ship training, and the things for a good another three months. Then you start actually to go in the water, etc. Oh, but if you oh, were, I'll, 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 I'll add to the oddity too. I'm sorry, um, I failed out of sea school, unable to learn, which was after basic enlisted submarine school, which I also excelled in and helped to bring my class to a, a, a level of honor that put us on a plaque on a wall that very rarely people get that honor. So not only was I screaming through everything up until a certain point in the Navy, I mean, literally, I was hitting marks that don't really happen. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was like, nope, you're done. You don't absorb information so anymore. What, what the heck happened to A? Because there's a lot of possibilities here a for them to wipe your memories or implant memories b for you to say i've had enough of this and i don't want nothing to do with it or c other what was it that uh like caused you to get out of gonna, that what what i'm happened? currently gonna i'm gonna currently choose c other um and i'm totally investigating that i don't have the answers yet i have suspicions um, but I'm gonna I'm I'm currently deciphering my experience in that category. I'm gonna go yeah. with C other. Something Perfect. really weird happened there. Um and I do know um one time I was at the train station waiting to go home for Liberty on a weekend. So this adds to the oddity of my submarine service. Yeah. Uh, I was approached by a gentleman who expressed that he was the executive officer of the USS Groton, which was an active duty. I've boat heard of the Groton. I've heard of so it. Yeah. He was he was claiming this. I knew from his look, his age, um, that he was lying. He was too old to be the executive officer of an active <laughs> submarine. Uh, so I knew that this gentleman was lying, but his line of questioning was interesting to me because it was, I guess you would say, along the lines of stuff that we were trained to look out for i mean i've i've been privy to all kinds of info and we were also trained on how to guard that and and things so this guy was coming from an angle that was hot i guess you would say and i was intrigued as a 19 year old submariner who's getting probed so to say spy and, talk hot when you say hot spy talk he was, hot. yeah he was asking he was asking shit that i know I'm not supposed to be discussing, and he's not supposed to be knowing to ask. You know? Don't ask, yeah. don't tell, hot. Yeah, so there was, there was shenanigans afoot for sure. Um, how it operates, roots, etc. Like, uh, calm it down with all that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I was, I was kind of just playing along to see, like, where's, where's this gonna go? What is this guy up to? This is, you know, I've, I've got some training on this, so just, let's just, to try to do everything appropriately, um, which is hilarious because I was not doing everything appropriately. <laughs> um, I was, it's, fun. I was, it's fun sometimes. Yeah, I was I was underage, and this guy, you know, his angle was like, hey, sailor, you know, let's chat. Let me buy you a beer. I'm the XO. And I was like, well, you know, I, I have you, to. You wanted you. to be cool. Okay, I'll tell you something. I, I, well, I, I, I no, I totally knew this was shenanigans. There was no trying to be cool. Yeah. I was, I was. This was shenanigans, um, but I was willing to to play the game. And I even went in so far as because he was he was offering to buy me a beer, which right then and there I, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, this could be a setup. This could be the base police. This could this could be so many things right now. I could be getting trapped in so many ways, <laughs> right? 
So I, I'm, I'm playing game, you know, let's go, let's BS, let's chat. And, um, you know, he's, he's hitting every angle, trying to stop, I'm, I'm evading and doing a good job of everything, I think. Um, and the next thing I know, I mean, I, I have to get back to the train station. Effectively, I ran into this dude at the train station. I got to get a train. So, okay, let's jump in a cab. I'll get you back to the train. 10-4. As I was entering the cab from the passenger side on the rear, I remember looking at my watch, gauging the time. And I remember thinking, you know, whatever it was, okay, you know, it's going to take us, you know, 20 minutes to get back to the train station or whatever. I'm going to make it and so on and so forth. Everything's great. You know, just checking the time. When we got back to the train station, I had lost 20 minutes, so to say. I looked at my watch again, and it was like, whoa, that cab ride with that dude, I straight up lost 20 minutes. I knew it immediately at that time, and I had no idea what to do with that then. It took me many, no, many, many, no recollection. many years to deal Nothing. with what happened in that cab to... Um, I, I, there's no concept for many years in my brain of someone to be able to wipe you to do any of that stuff. So I just held that in as the freakiest thing that ever happened to me in was, my life was for it, a very long was time. Was it a wipe? Was that? I, I, I don't. I don't like know. That? I just. I. I can only tell you that I experienced losing 20 minutes, and it was the. It was a hard reality it was weird it was like i felt robbed i felt like 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 almost something was in. taken away i got from you. yeah it was, it was amazing how out of control i felt at that moment because it was like i knew sure. yeah yeah it was after like i got out of the cab I, I departed i knew that i lost that 20 minutes but to me that was in my brain that was 20 minutes of my life that i had just lost control of and i was like what the fuck just happened other than that 20 minutes, it was a standard cab ride. Okay, I'm just going home. I got to yes. talk to this guy. Thanks for the yeah. ride. I need a ride. Later, crazy guy. Yes. Peace. Absolutely. But the 20 minutes missing left the impact on you. And there was mm -hmm. something else about that that you'll never get back. And that's what you're feeling. Right. Yeah, yeah, wow. absolutely. Yeah, it was like something was stolen from me in a way. And what it could be. <laughs> we could sit yeah, here all day. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and part of me thinks it was the 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 recollection of what was really going on in submarine school, or in the you know that I don't I do not uh. believe I do not believe that I was having trouble learning stuff. I think that was an implanted memory to cover for whatever they removed or are masking. And then to speak further to that, when we continue into the rest of your journey. Mm -hmm. It proves that you're more than capable. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's not like you're a guy that just gives up or whatever. Right, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, moving from that experience, you know, you're in the Navy. A lot of strange stuff. Of You were definitely in there. What, why you left and what you remember from it, it seems a little manipulated and fishy out of there. But, um, from that point of leaving the Navy, and what year was that? Just to keep everyone. That would have been in 1994, which I oh think. Oh my everybody... goodness. Yeah, which is a banner <laughs> year for disclosure and everything happening on this planet. I keep trying to impress upon people that like 1994. 1993, too. And yeah, yeah, 93, 94, right there. That, that 93, 94 uh, crux. That our whole world changed, and we've yet to figure out why. Something I know. massive occurred in our cosmos. I don't know, but everything changed there. That was the transition yeah. point. 93, 94, that was it. That was we turned the corner. Everything changed. It's, in all you know, of the program. In every program, everything changed. Absolutely. And, you know, my family's UFO crash happened in 1991. They told us to keep an eye out. So in 1992, 1993, we were really watching it. Oh, yeah, something was going on. And they had a countdown for 2001, and we saw the distraction that happened. So um, it, it's one of those situations. And from your experiences, so this is 1993, 1994 area. 
and I think your Antarctica experiences happened in 2011. Am I mm-hmm. correct? 10, 10 going... 11. Yep. So from, from the Navy to the Antarctica, from 93, 94 to 2000, you know, Antarctica, what was going on in that process uh, leading up to you going to Antarctica? I wound up getting into a plumbing career that, oddly right enough, had me working on the north shore of Long Island, which is referred to as the Gold Coast for a reason. I would suggest it actually has the richest people on our planet living there. I would say it's the head of the United States military industrial complex and intelligence community, of which I became their plumber. So whether it was, you know, the the corporation or the owner's home of the multi-billion dollar weapons complex, I would get to go into their bathroom and see the magazine rack that said Council on Foreign Relations Monthly or Trilateral Commission Quarterly. So, so, so of, you were the military complex elite plumber. Yep. I believe and I was on some sort of approved list because I do not believe be. that when somebody like Bill Gates has a leaky sink in his master bathroom, he doesn't go to the yellow pages. Somebody has to be find approved. some guy from the Bronx to come Correct. in and Correct. like take, you have Correct. to have clearance. Absolutely. Correct. So I believe that I was that guy. And the facilities that I was in. <laughs> Yo, you, you're real life Mario. Hey, the Mario brothers going underground <laughs> fighting the Draconians? Fighting yep. the Draconians oh, underground? That's so funny. Oh, that's so funny. Cleaning them out with Drano? Montauk projects? Draco, you're Drano? Drano, you're Draco? Me. Like, oh, bro. You're killing me. <laughs> no, nothing wrong with Mario brothers. King Koopa, Reptilian oh, Draco so Evolution, funny. the Fun Guy. The memory, the memory oh. loss, the spores, the amnesia, consciousness, a different level. Like, <laughs> Dude, that, that is awesome. I great. never really dawned on me that Mario Brothers was promoting uh, plumbers on mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need got you need to have a little mustache. Oh, Call you the, so Mon- the Montauk Mario. <laughs> Oh, that's like great. you called me earlier, Indiana oh, Earl. Indiana Earl. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, good stuff. But um, for real though, um, you're right about the high clearance. You know, I my my father-in-law, he's a high clearance contractor involved with a lot of things, commercial crane operator, building for all the big names in the Cape building a lot of classified things and the yep. dumbs and etc but um you know it's they have clearance on them they know every phone call you make they know you all your family members where you live etc and you're absolutely right and yep. from that point of being a plumber and working with you know the plumbing for the military complex and other sociable people that needed a high clearance did you have your own plumbing company did you work for someone else how did that go down i i did Rotor have a Rooters. Career. i did have a career working um as a directly employed plumber for some of the some of the best companies on long island i'll, I'll just put it that way and i, I so the companies up. hired out through you right and they were in contact I, with all of this they, Correct. I, for for the most part of my career, I was directly employed by somebody, and then wow. these customers were utilizing these contracting companies. Um, it got to a point um, where I was able to branch out on my own. I, I did build up enough of a name for myself um, that I did no longer need the uh, direct employment situation because I I did also understand. I started. To, I started to understand my clients were evil. I really did. Yeah. And it was it was it was hard to deal with that type of clientele. I was functional yeah. at it. I was I was doing it, um, but it was hard to deal with those types of folks. Um, billionaires are not the nicest people, oddly enough. <laughs> There's a few exceptions. But there are a few exceptions. I'm not gonna lie. I've they're met rare. Quite a few. 
very rare. <laughs> very, very rare um, that you're going to have old money be kind. Yeah, especially really billionaires. I, I've met really friendly, down-to-earth millionaires that were mm -hmm. great people, but I've never even met a billionaire, come to think about it, so I can't even imagine. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so um, so you're, you're doing that for a while. You're mm -hmm. getting the vibe of it. You're understanding this uh, social class, we can call mm -hmm. it politely, mm -hmm. social yeah. class that you and I have... <laughs> no idea about but um, at what point and how did you get from being a plumber to the elite's toilets and military complex to going to freaking Antarctica dude how, how, how well, here's, here's, how, here's how I've happen? connected the, here's how I'm going to answer that now in the, in the deciphering of my experience um I've, I've come to connect how this path works better than I've explained in the past. So, as I mentioned to you earlier, there was somebody that I met at the New London train station in 1994. I continued my plumbing career. And I guess it would be around 2008-ish. I was called to a customer's house in due form. I have, you know, my company. Somebody contacts me and they say they have a plumbing problem. I respond. That's how life works, right? I show up to this house in Roslyn, Long Island, which I will say is the heart of the intelligence community in the United States of America since prior to its inception and always has been and has never it stopped. Is. Roslyn, Long Island is the heart of the United States intelligence community. So Roslyn. I was at this gentleman's. Correct. I was at this gentleman's home as a service call for his boiler was the was the presentation. Oh. I went I went into his boiler room and I was servicing his boiler. I was replacing the boiler feed, the water feed on his boiler. Actually, it might have been the circulator. I went to that boiler a couple of times now that I mentioned it, so I forget which was the first call. But on my first visit to this boiler, I got into a conversation with the customer who was standing in the doorway of the boiler room, basically blocking my egress. He was a, a, a tall enough man. He's not a small of stature person. He was a, a, a formidable man in his senior years. Um, but either way, he's uh, in a position blocking the doorway, which I'm a, I'm a worker. I go to strange places all the time. These are things I, I pay attention to for my own security, right? I'm in a stranger's home and I realize this guy's taking the He's taking the door blocking position is what it is, but I'm doing my job just noticing. And we're engaging in a conversation that most people would say at the time was uber conspiratorial. Okay. And I would say it was, it was interesting to me that a customer was being so engaging because it was out of the ordinary. Like, so this is fun. <laughs> yeah, it's fun for me. It's making my day go great, right? I have no yeah. problem with the angle that he's going. And we're talking about all kinds of kooky stuff. And yeah. he seems to start getting crazier and kookier i don't okay. think it was that kooky though was it fair enough but it gets to a point <laughs> it gets to a point where all of a sudden it clicks i get what he was getting at and i get up and i look at him in the doorway because i now realize he's the guy from the cab wait he, he was the same guy from the cab the same guy with the boiler that you're working Correct. And this is 2008. Correct. So four years later. Uh, 14 years later. 1994 oh, to 2008. Oh, this was two, oh, 14 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And he now called you basement. specifically to come That is to exactly what I just said to him. Because when it got crazy, I got up from where I was at and I looked him dead in the eyes. And I said, you called me here. Yeah. I, said, I didn't come knocking on your door. I said, you called me here. What's going on? And, he and was there anything actually wrong? Because you said you replaced he had, he a had couple actual, things. He had an actual problem. That was the first time I was at his house. He had an actual okay. problem. Which well, I'm okay. sure this is, you know, I'm sure this is how these things work. I, I've been, put it this way, I've been to a lot of homes and I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of agents. Yeah. Everybody has a plumbing problem that is worthy of them calling the plumber in for. 
<laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. And then at that point, when I'm changing the flapper on the toilet, lots of times I would get an earful and a stack yeah. of books. That would happen all the time. I would show up to people's homes. I would show up to people's homes. You'll get a kick out of this. I'd be, I'd be talking to my friend, okay? Everybody thinks that cell phones are listening to you now. No, they've always been listening. Because yeah. way back when, when they first came out, I'd be talking to my friend. And the next thing you know, the next day, I'd get a call to go to somebody's house because their toilet's leaking. And they would then engage me with the topic that I was talking about the day before and then send me off with a stack of books based on that topic. I have a whole library of books that were given to me by plumbing customers that called me up to their house to fix their plumbing problem and give me a stack of books. It's almost like the plumbing was just the front to keep you busy and to keep tabs you on you and to you prepare think? you, you to think? prepare you for what was coming later because, right? The perfect segue. Yes. As a kid, yep. you're going through all these training experiments, experiences. And they have a thousand percent control over my income because they can literally control whether my phone rings or not. Oh, he doesn't he, have enough money in his bank account. Give him a call. Our pipes are fine for the next three years. Sorry, you don't got a job. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, and they literally could call any. Uh, you know how many plumbers there are in Long Island, in New York? Yes. <laughs> Everyone in their uncle, cousin, grandfather. Uh, yes, I know. do. And and I know the looks from the other plumbers at the plumbing supply house when I'd be picking up parts and they go, where are you working? Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everybody was, Oh, no, no, it was just, they were, it was it was unbelievable to them. They are like, how, how did you get to do that? You land that, we got to do this... Uh, PJ complex, you know, mm. <laughs> falling down yeah. apartment building, and you're doing mansions and government officials, etc. Um, that's crazy. Yes. Yeah, so we're right into it with all this leading up. There has to be a reason why. And that was well, 2008, that, and then so 2008, I met this gentleman again, and he, um, I guess you would say he befriended me at that point mm -hmm. he, he started uh just straight up he started educating me into a lot of the history of our country uh espionage nikola tesla a whole bunch of things it's not what everybody thinks is going on in any way shape or form and i don't even know where to begin with on that conversation it's a lot because of history there's, there's a lot of stuff books. that i could say that i learned from that man Almost none of it I could prove, so we all know how those conversations will go. Because yeah. of all the stuff and the experiences that I have that I can prove, people still give me a hard time with the stuff that I can prove. Yeah. So I'm not even going to go down the road yet of the stuff that I can't prove because that will just get me locked up in a loony bin. But yeah. it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that I have to I have to do due diligence to now you know, cross the T's and dot the I's to be able to make it provable for people, which I think is why I was put on the path that I was put on, is that nobody else is going to fight this fight for the truth because nobody else has the experience that I have. It's just that mm -hmm. simple. I've seen a lot of things that people haven't seen. It's a privileged position that I operate from, but I'm obliged to now do something with my experience and share it with other people because I see them as in harm's way. And yeah. I think it's unfair. I shouldn't say unfair. I think it's completely wrong, right? If I'm in the bar and you're in the bar and you're across the room and I see that you're about to get sucker punched, I'm obliged to say something. Yeah. So that's all I see this as is I've, I've lived Duck. a life. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see reality for everybody else about to get sucker punched or in the throes of a fight. And I'm just simply saying, you have to do something, right? And everybody's like, how dare you tell us this is, you're trying to make us, you're telling us what to do. No, no, no. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you to do something. And to what to look for. Right. To be prepared for. Yeah, everybody gets mad at me because I'm putting them to action, so to say. But that would be like you if I'm saying like, hey, Robert, watch out. That guy's going to hit you. And you're like, oh, how dare you tell me that I have to do something. You're trying to make me do. All right, then get hit. I don't <laughs> care, <dude. laughs> and, and then And then what happens? I get hit and then I turn around and I blame you. Yeah, yeah. The community works and like are you yep. kidding me i told all of you and now you're yep. falling for these tricks and antics 
I yeah. told you. I didn't yeah. make you or force you to listen to me. I, you're, you're a sovereign being. I you came know, out um, a few years ago. I tried expressing <laughs> my experiences about Antarctica, but unfortunately yeah. it seemed like the community wanted to listen to folks like Corey Good. I don't, I don't that understand. Hasn't been to Antarctica. Right. You've no, been no, there. No, yeah. I, do, I get a and, kick out of, I get a kick out of all these people, right? When they're like, Oh, I was in Antarctica, and they're like, "Oh, did you get any?" Pic oh no, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to take pictures. You're not allowed to bring cameras. Really? How come I got Asterly, Asterly in Antarctica, okay. which means not there. I mean, which means not there. I yeah. mean, come on. I mean, seriously, I've been I've been to so many facilities now where I was told that you're not allowed to take pictures or video, but I have pictures and video. So all these all these other people out there when you they're do. whistleblowers, I know they're full of crap. Yep. Same here. I, I I have pictures that I took that I shouldn't have, but I took them because I knew no one would believe me if mm -hmm. I told them I was on a, you know, a work site of sorts. Yeah. So, and I just want everyone to know before we start to talk about Antarctica, I've watched a lot of Eric's videos of him in Antarctica, like... <laughs> 10 foot on a good day visibility snow um you know these uh huge projects he was in charge of you know maintenancing taking care of you went from a plumber to working on some serious serious maintenance like stuff that made toilets and plumbing look like a joke but it's all kind of connected because these um energy stations these power places and other parts of these facilities for researchers there's a lot of piping to keep everything warm and to stop from freezing so your plumbing knowledge actually played a really great role um i'm sure that came in handy along with your submarine knowledge as well a lot yeah. of my life experience prior to South Pole was very handy for being there. And I think it all I, led up to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I actually think that that tail end, that, that meeting in Roslyn um, with the gentleman from 1994, I, I think was actually, I think that was my interview, not the interview that I had a couple of years later. Oh, really? You think I that think, was the initial, the, I think the that door? Was, I think so. I think that was. I think that was the transition that, that I was getting tapped and pushed towards that program, and educated yeah. to be prepared for that program. So that I, I guess eventually you would say that um, I found myself applying in the standard form. But I, again, I think this is one of those situations where um, you know, I, I've said before in life, right? That there's so many times in life, right? You know you know, a fork presents itself in the road in front of you, Robert, right? And you, you say, you know, I'm going to either go to the left, or I'm going to go to the right, but let me make a decision. Let me think about what's going on here because I want to make the right decision. I want to make the right choice and I'm free to make a decision right now, whether I go right or left. How many people when they're at that fork in the road pause and say, who built this road? <laughs> yeah. So true. That lets me, no that one. lets you no lets one. you believe lets you believe that you're about to make a free will decision. So I'm just decision very to go left or right. Why do I gotta go left or right at all? Why can't I just right. go up and over? Understood, but not many people are doing this in life or <laughs> paying attention to the road construction. They're in denial. I'm just paying attention to the fact that I appearingly have been making false free choices and it's not a good feeling i've came to that conclusion of in retrospect when you look at it you're like i thought i was being crazy wild and free and rebellious just like my soul is and then you find out no i did exactly what they wanted me to do and then you, you feel you feel duped, kind of going yes. back to what you felt in that taxi cab, that 20 yep. minutes of missing time. You're like, I, it's not a good feeling because we, we, we think we're in control. And to find out, like, no matter, like, I'm like, oh, I'll just, I'll pick up this hat right now and I'll throw it. That was my decision. And the universe turns that into something much larger. And it's like, oh, I don't have no free will. 
Um, so, yeah, if you could, how in the heck did you get to Antarctica? What was that process about? And more importantly, um, what the basics of what you can say, what were you doing down there, etc. And you come across anything interesting? <laughs> more or less, I guess you would say the process getting down there was just simply a massive process going from Long Island to the West Coast, passing through Colorado. We did some training there on um, fire brigade stuff, learning how to train in Colorado before yes. going down the absolutely yes South we went to America. Uh, went down. Well, actually, we passed through um, Australia. But we went to uh, Centennial, Colorado, Raytheon Polar Services had us out there for, we had to do uh, emergency response training. So as a member of the Winter Over crew, everybody has to jump onto one of the four emergency response teams. I, and I jumped onto team two, which was the fire brigade and became the, the, the fire team lead, I guess you would say, co-lead. There was a, a, I was a co-lead on the team. and. So we trained for that down there. We had training on uh, Dr. Nicoletti, who was the psychologist for the Denver Broncos. I believe also the LA police and stuff like that. Some big name shrink. Um, they brought him in to train us um, to get our, our brains prepared for that environment, both as individuals and a collective, you know, to go that remote, uh, you know, they, they wanted to prep us as best as they could. They brought in folks from Knoll, the Wilderness Medicine Institute. We had to get certified as as uh, first responders for you know emergency emergencies. Medical stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. all kinds of stuff. So they were they were training us on all kinds of stuff to just you know up our skill sets. Because when you're down there, stuff, you're, you're down there. You, you don't it. got help. It takes a long time for someone else to get there. It's not like no one's. At the time, no one's come. That was it. It was yeah. you know, the winter season. That's it. We had we had forty nine souls, and we we lasted. We made it. <laughs> we started with forty nine. Finished with forty nine. That was that was the mission. Um, and yes, no one was coming to help. So, you know, yes, most most days were relatively boring. Um, yeah. But there were moments that we would say it was just complete sheer terror because that's it figured out this is not good and no yeah. one's coming to help there's i mean there's a, a couple of days during my winter season um which were probably the scariest moments of my entire life uh -huh. there was um you know we had alarms going off regularly <laughs> it was not uh inactive we like problems. like uh you know pipe bursting temperature issues what were the alarms and uh you know what were the Usually, alarms pertaining to oxygen levels etc fire fire wait fire so i was on a fire brigade we we, we were responding to fire issues alarms. a lot of fires we didn't we i wouldn't say we had a lot of actual fires but we had a lot of we did have a lot of alarms. We did have um, sensors for um, air quality issues, which would become questionable sometimes. Um, we had a lot of false alarms that we still had to respond to, but we we did have a couple of um, legit ones. We oh, had wow. a we had a fire in the cryo building, the balloon inflation facility. This was probably the scariest event. So. It's an outbuilding. It's probably about a quarter mile walk from the elevated station where our heater is at. So the that's a long went... walk in the snow. In those temperatures, it's, it, it's the winter season, and um, our ten gear. Miles. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? It's like ten miles. Yeah, you know? it adds up. It's, it's harsh. <laughs> so the oh. the alarms went off, and we we. Uh, my co-lead and I went to our gear lockers as we, you know, were trained to do. And the first responders, uh, we had a we had a team that whenever an alarm goes off, they go immediately to the problem to assess. They're not to engage. What they're doing is gathering intel from myself and my co-lead as we gear up to go attack the problem. The attack team, literally, fighting. What to bring? You need Correct. to know what so to bring. 
Right, so we're, we're gearing up, we're at the lockers and the alarms are active. So this is a real situation. Um, we don't play games, we, we never, you know, yes, there are a lot of false alarms. We never treated anything as fake. Um, that's just stupid. <laughs> but yeah. on this particular circumstance, myself and my colleagues were at our gear lockers and we knew that we were heading outside. So this is also, it's different, you know, these are all things that we have to consider. So inside firefighting is, is room temperature. Um, if we have to go outside with our gear, we do things very differently because none of this stuff is designed for those temperatures. So we have to gear up better. So in this moment, um, she and I, you're, you're dressing each other, actually. It's faster. Um, so when we go to the lockers, we start putting our stuff on ourselves, but you start connecting the other person. You start dressing them. It's just faster. So that's what we were doing. Um, she and I were dressing each other, listening, talking, you know, okay, let me get this for you, let me get that for you, blah, blah, blah. And we're listening to all of the other radio chatter from the three other teams going hot on this problem. Mm -hmm. In the process, we hear the team one responders getting to the scene. <laughs> and they announce over the radio that it's fully engulfed, employed, and smoking. This was our first legitimate, this is burning. This is not, this is not a drill now. This is fucking legit. And let me tell you, that building that is now actively on fire, that I now know, right? So these guys made that announcement. She and I stopped talking immediately. As soon as they said that, our, our mouths shut off and we just continued moving our hands in silence. Yeah, we we threw our gear on, um, grabbed fire extinguishers over each of our shoulders, and we proceeded to start humping out over the ice towards this building. And I swear to you, Robert. Okay, so this building had let's just say between four and five hundred thousand gallons of compressed helium. Helium. I knew you were going to say balloon. Being, uh, being held, <coughs> being held at about four degrees Kelvin, which is about four degrees above absolute zero. If they so went we, up, if they went up, if there was a leak, if gone. that fire, if that fire caused that system to leak, it would have caused such a massive expansion and discharge that that volume. What I was told by the on-site scientists was that that would have expanded at 450 to 1. So that would have just been like a, a I don't know if you're familiar with the term, like a blevy, like a, just a big, <laughs> like a super. So she and I were walking towards that building. I can still, I can still, I can, <clears throat> I can, I can picture that night that the, the the view that the moon was out and um, it was very low and this was at night time well it's it's the winter time at south pole okay. so it's, I it's always you, yeah. dark it's always, always dark, dark. but yeah. i remember the moon was there that night so it was like yeah had a, like it was almost backlit the building that we were going towards okay yeah and i can just rem i can remember the silence i can i can i can remember hearing her breathing i can i, can, I these are, there's not much there there's not a lot going on so i remember all of the sounds walking towards that building in our muted silence. And I just kept thinking that, that the building's about to blow up. I was waiting, I was waiting to just see it, it turn like round and have the wall come at me at Mach 12. I just, I didn't really expect we were gonna make it to the building. I just remember yeah. walking towards it being like, well, I mean, this is what we're doing. We're gonna walk towards that building right now. I don't think we're gonna make it. I just thought it was going to blow up before we ever got there. Yeah. But we made it. We put the fire out and here. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. And that explosion would have messed up a lot of stuff in the area. Too. I think it would have took out half the elevated station. Yeah. I, I think I think in hindsight we we had yeah, I mean that much helium compressed, confined and released next to each other and released I think I think we would have lost. We 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 had a discussion on this, and I believe we probably would have lost the half of the elevated station that was closest to that facility, 
and then the discussion that we were debating was that the other half of our building actually had what we called um, the, the emergency pod in case there was a, a major disaster. We had like this smaller section that we could reduce down and retreat into, so to say. And yeah. we were questioning whether that um, escape pod actually would have survived also. Oh, wow. Which, that's that's we really wondering. bad. We were like, we were, <laughs> that's, yeah, like, so it's like, that's it. Like, that at that point, like, the South Pole Station is basically set up for one catastrophe. Yeah. You can retreat back into this supposed escape area. Um, but if that escape area... The engineers area, messed up... If that escape get that area gets the... screwed up in the catastrophe, <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a wrap. You're done. Yeah, they should have put that way away from the helium and yeah. other explosive. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it was it was pretty far away, don't get me wrong. Like, it was not, it wasn't, you know, it was just, you know. That's a lot of helium. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, it's, 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 it's a lot of expansion. Jeez. And um, so, you know, you were down there doing maintenance. You were on any sort of emergency such as that you had to respond to i'm sure you had a lot of other duties you said there was only 49 people yes. 49 yes. people and this is a whole facility and i know for a fact everyone has a duty everyone has a job everyone plays their script everyone does their part and then 20 other jobs that weren't even your job you also gotta do Yes. Uh, you know, we call that and, house mousing. Yeah. That's called it, house mousing. You all yeah. go through it. And yeah. with that being said, with your time down there, because, you know, I've never talked to anyone that's been to Antarctica. And, you know, in the UFO and alien world, everyone has a lot to say about Antarctica. Every video I've ever seen of people in Antarctica, they can barely see five, ten feet in front of their face because there's so much snow. So my question is, did you ever have a time where you could see, and more importantly, I know everyone's so worried about Antarctica down on the ground, but one of my questions is, what did you see above Antarctica? That's a question nobody ever asked, but it's, in my head, your view, you must see everything. Everything. Everything, everything, everything. Every it's satellite, like, every UFO, every would, comet. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Every star, every constellation, every aspect of the sky. Yes, I would see satellites. Yes, I did see a UFO. I don't want to say every because, you know, I, God only knows what I was missing. But I certainly did see um, plenty of satellites going by. Um, I did see a UFO there. Um, but in the grand scheme of the value of the view, it's just space it is so beyond awesome i cannot begin to tell you what i got to see with my eyes in the winter time at the south pole station the, and they, they they have the aurora borealis oh yes. as well uh, australis so, the aurora australis yes amazing i saw yeah. amazing auroras down there off the wall auroras and views of the sky so you have to imagine that the, the South Pole Station is at an actual elevation of 10,300 feet. So you're up high, and it's an ice field. There's no, there's nothing there. So everything, for all practical purposes, when you look around from the facility, you don't see anything, right? Everything else in the world is technically below your horizon line. So when you look out to the horizon, that's it. So in the winter time, right? You walk out of the building and you look everywhere and the whole world is flat from your perspective you simply just have to raise your gaze a couple of degrees and at that point the earth drops out of view now you can That's... turn 360 degrees and you're in space yeah it's there's no difference yeah it's no different from it's... like say ground level here in new jersey put me ten thousand plus you know, feed in the air. There's, that That's where you are. There's no, the, the, the view would be the exact same. Ready for this? When, I, when you talk about looking toward space, right? Looking toward space, the view would be the exact same from where I was as if you're on the space station. Oh, wow. You think that distance from me to the space station matters between me and the next closest constellation? 
Yeah, exactly. It's the same perspective. And that that's pretty high and like, you know, equivalent that's something like uh Pikes Peak, one of the highest mountains in Colorado, the Rocky well, Mountains. Understood, that's, but now imagine yeah, now imagine it's being up completely there. pitch black and once you no once you raise pollution. your gaze yeah, once you raise your gaze and you do a three hundred and sixty view, you don't see anything except the space. The ocean and water. Oh, that that must have been mind blowing. And what what was the UFO you saw? Can you go over that? I'm yeah, really absolutely. curious. So I was walking back one day from doing my rounds. There's an area known as the dark sector that we have. Um, the the Mapo facility is a, a set of telescopes in there. Um, there's the South Pole Telescope proper. And then there's also what's called the Ice Cube Neutrino Detector. And they're all in an area called the dark sector. And it was part of an area that I'd have to walk out to and do my rounds. Um, the Ice Cube Neutrino Detector, that building being the furthest one um, in that stretch, which was about three quarters of a mile away from the elevated station. So I was returning back on this particular day. The way that the weather was, was there was um, a blowing snow, which was blowing from the ground up to about eye level. And it's, you know, blowing laterally across the surface of the ice. But then above that, is it's clear. I mean, so that's how it is. Like, if, you know, sometimes it'll be blowing and it's just above your head so that you're still down in the blowing snow. You look up and you can't see anything. It just yeah. Happens. Yeah. So on this particular day, it was, it was like about up to eye level. So there were times where I was walking up trying to you know, watch the ground so I don't break my ass. Um, but there <laughs> were other times where I would try to like almost like tiptoe and, 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 and peek up over and try over to see how snow. far... How far is it to the elevated station, my destination that I'm trying to walk to? And um, there's a red light on the side of the building that I can see in the distance, and that's what I was aiming to gauge the distance at. And it was at the moment that I was trying to peek up and look to see my distance that all of a sudden from my left, which at South Pole would have been what we called grid north, uh, as far as bearings go. Coming from grid oh, yeah. north, the front of the elevated station was this giant, massive, flaming fireball that was shooting from the left on all the way over the station, and it went all the way. It basically went from horizon line to horizon line, like almost in the blink of an eye. And I can't oh, that's even be- fast. Oh, it was fast. so fast. It was so fast. It was so fast. I can't even begin to calculate how something can go that distance so quickly. I, I'm beside myself to imagine the speed um and in, you you've seen meteorites hands down of course you've seen oh this is going way faster that, than that yeah so uh that's my question to you what made this a uh, you know something else other than that oh, and because it was, it was speed because it was this because of the speed and the uh and the course it yeah. was flying parallel to the surface of the earth from my perspective going from horizon to horizon That's so it weird deviate. so it wasn't going from up to down like it was crashing yeah was and regardless across. of what rock is flying through space no space rock is traveling at uh mach 8 you know it's not happening you know mm -hmm. so what what the heck could have that been um yeah and it, it wasn't weird. until um it wasn't until um even after I had told the story originally to uh, Ileana when I first um, came out and was talking, and it hadn't even dawned on me at that point that it was anything other than a meteor. But it was well, it's just a shooting star. Woo yeah, it, you know, but it, it didn't really dawn on me until many years later about the the the, the controlled flight path, and it was just it clicked finally. I was like, no, I guess I guess that thing wasn't of it and how it yeah. was operating oh yeah it is pin pin straight parallel it held its course it never it just went straight as narrow from one horizon line all the way across to the other wow wow and you know continuing that so that was something and you're like whoa i I hope I got enough oxygen. <laughs> you know, like, I, I even, I even when I got into the facility, I was like, yeah. oh, like, oh, wow, like, like, ready to, like, you know, say, like, oh, this must be a big deal because I know they, like, I know they monitor meteors and stuff in Antarctica and they collect they them and they do all this stuff. There. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, I figured this is a big deal, right? So I get inside it. I cross paths with the facility engineer. Hey, he's, you know, hey, how's it going out there? Anything? Different? I said, I just saw this huge freaking thing. I thought it was going to be a big deal. And he was always like, oh, cool. And he walked away. And I'm like, huh. I guess Which, no big deal. A, a great <sighs> question. With your time down there, that that's something you saw. Did you hear anything else from other staff members or from other experiences um, you had down there? Where you know, did you hear about anything, discoveries, anything that stood out of um, our normal understanding of Antarctica? Something that was, whoa, this is out of here. Yes, big time. <laughs> um, I'm sure. The, the ice cube neutrino detector that I mentioned earlier. I was going to ask. Sector. I don't know what that is, and I saw that okay. you had so, a pin for it. So on the. Um, on the surface, as presented, it's a scientific instrument for measuring measuring uh, the activity of neutrinos in our environment at the South Pole. In the in ice. Yeah, in the ice. Correct. This, gotcha. this, this is a massive system that's embedded in the ice. It is. Additionally, what I found out and provided documentation for on my website, deciphering TV, in the archive section, on this something out. called the. The DOM document, okay? This document provides the evidence that the ice cube neutrino detector also transmits. And they never told anyone that. Transmits what? Transmits whatever they're transmitting. I have paperwork that proves it transmits. The next fair question is, what are you transmitting? I get that. I don't have paperwork to prove what they're transmitting though. I just but have paperwork it's to prove transmitting, it transmitting something. It transmits. There's no argument to that anymore. Uh, People need to, to deal with that because you're right. Everybody goes, oh, well, if he doesn't know what it's. Uh, hold on a second. It I doesn't it matter. Transmitting, folks. That's step one. We're not at the top <laughs> of the staircase yet, but let's not ignore step one yeah. of the staircase. So and that's where I'm at right now. And the resistance that I'm getting from folks is I get that they want more. I get that. I want more too, but let's deal with where we're at right now. Let's not ignore the reality that I've presented. And this device in there, studying what it's studying, there's a lot of bacteria and other anomalies that are in our ice that has been there a very long time, very mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. And you know, ice melts eventually. And it rebuilds itself back up eventually. Mm -hmm. So, in connection with that aspect of it, what is this device really um, gauging and really studying more specifically? If you could elaborate on, on, for everyone the, out uh, there. On the science side, the primary mission of the yeah. ice cube neutrino detector is meant to detect when a neutrino, which there are trillions of these neutrinos passing through us all the time, they are very small particles that can pass um, in between the electron shell and the nucleus of an atom, they're that small. So they move at, near, or beyond the speed of light was what we were being told at the time. For all practical purposes, when a neutrino contacts the nucleus of an ice molecule in the ice in Antarctica, uh, a reaction occurs where a blue flash of light comes out and the nucleus and the neutrino are gone and now there's something called a muon instead so the detector is actually looking for the blue flash of light in the ice when that occurs <laughs> they have they have 5160 of what they call doms digital optical modules that are embedded in the ice they're about the size of a basketball this is a, a it's a three-dimensional antenna Okay, so they have cables going down. On each cable going down, there's a there's each there's DOMs, so there's a whole bunch of these. But now these cables are strewn out from the surface of the ice going down all over the place. So now you have to picture that all of these balls, these electronic um, DOMs, are now in a, a hexagonal array covering one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer in embedded in the ice. Mm -hmm. So they were telling us initially that this is a receiver, it's a detector. Well, now that we know 
as my paperwork shows, each of the DOMs has the ability to transmit at up to 2,047 volts AC. So now you take that number At the speed of light. Well, 5,160 volts at whatever speed that is. So you take that yeah. ability to transmit. If each DOM has that ability, now you times that times 5,160. And now you're looking at the world's largest three-dimensional phased array transmitting antenna. Which man it just so we happens were... that just so happens to be sitting at the southern pole of our planet, which is a giant magnetosphere. Yep. Yep. And if we were using But people want to talk means... about Corey Good and people want to talk about, you know, alien this and alien that, which I don't doubt. I, I don't get me wrong. Let's Those talk about Tesla. Real. Let's take They're all that. real, right? But I, <laughs> I'm a big fan of priorities. Yeah, straight up. I don't doubt that all of this other stuff is going on, but I'm I'm kind of getting sick and tired of when I bring up brass tacks, real provable problems that my story gets diluted, that people come running from woodwork like Linda Moulton Howe, that maniac. Yeah, you know, um, they come running in and they go, well, what about um, my my secret guy that said this? And you're not saying what he said. Well, I'm not a liar, Linda. I'm just telling you the facts of what I've yeah. seen with my own eyes. Yeah. This is what it is. I was I there, don't know any you know? person discussing Antarctica, SSP, anything Oddsville, right? Anything Oddsville. Yeah. You show me anybody that has provided more actionable intelligence than me. Yeah, exactly. And for everyone that's watching this, what what we're getting at, you know, very similar to me in my family's case having articles evidence documentation etc you know he has this he has tons of yeah. videos his badges patches for being on the yeah. program pictures i, I mean there's a directed was, energy weapons system at least yeah. one two at least. technically there's two technically at least at, at south pole and i'm just letting people know these are the facts of the matter what do we now do with there are active directed energy weapons systems being played look what just happened in turkey i mean i literally yeah. spoke to dr greer i think about a year ago about how the system at the south pole station can cause earthquakes yeah and i, I this, told the world this is I told tied the world into that, harp absolutely when we fired it up at south pole station uh, uh, when I was at the South Pole, we were switching everything from construction to operations and maintenance. We were going live on stuff. That included the ice cube neutrino detector. Well, oddly enough, when they started firing up the detector was when Christchurch, New Zealand started getting crushed by earthquakes. I remember that. And, that you was, know, these, that was these, the, these signals... That was called an accident. Yeah, and these, <laughs> these signals you're talking about, like you said, we can talk all day of who, what, where, when, etc. But they are coming in and they are going out. <laughs> and yep. it's called calls and reaction. Mm -hmm. And it's going on. And one thing you said that really something in my head sparked. You said blue lights. Mm -hmm. Blue lights is something that is really, really personal. I've had personal experiences with uh blue things and i did not know this about that chain reaction of this and um were they ever able to document these blue lights did you ever see this documented well, I, or well i not myself i know that they did have reactions that they captured so that would mean that they did have witness they events they, they have were... absolutely yeah so uh but, if i um, remember correctly i'm terrible with uh, the pronunciation I believe um, that that blue light effect of the um, of the nucleus impact and the muon ejection. I believe they call that Cherenkov radiation. Oh wow! And so is that titled. something just specifically in say the Arctic and the South Pole, or is this something that can be found all around the world? I think it's specific to the reaction and the only reason that you're going to with find the it in the South Pole is because of, yeah, you know, I mean, where are you going to get a glacier full of ice to do this with other than South Pole? Other than the Arctic or etc. I, yeah, I yeah. got you. Okay. Yeah. Wow. 
Ohara. Just, no, just I'm go. Done. No, go right. No, go. Take your time. <laughs> take your time. I, I, this, I, 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 I appreciate when people actually think about what I'm saying. By all means, enjoy. <laughs> and I, I would love to, you know, um, see this, uh, you know, energetic reaction that occurs within this ice and all of that. That's amazing. That they're even the fact that they have instrumentation in the hexagon, as you said, these spheres studying this. Just imagine if we were living in Tesla's world and we weren't using ACDC. Yes. It basically, they have like the Earth's generator down there. Yep. What you're getting at. And guess no what? Any frequency that comes out at a pole gets circulated through the entire planet. And the That's side what effects. I'm trying to tell people. That's what I'm trying no. to tell people is that they have this device there now that transmits that is literally it's like it's like tapping the phone line of Mother Earth, right? And I'm trying we to do, tell we people do, we don't know the side effects. You, even the I do. Don't I'm trying. I'm, try, I'm trying to let people know exactly what's going on, and no one's listening. Um, yeah, it's mind control. This is what's going on. Is this is the technologies available? We can look up guys like Dr. James Giordano, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Duncan, or I ah, get the name mixed up, but the guy that was with DARPA, these these technologies exist. Yeah. Right? Everybody's just saying, well, if somebody knew, if somebody saw something, they should say, listen, I'm just doing it. I'm a human being. I'm doing the right thing. There's a, a bad technology. Point. There's a bad a great... technology on this planet, and I need to let everybody know because no one's paying attention. I mean, if the last two years on this planet haven't taught us that there's mass mind control going on, I don't know what the fuck to tell people. Yeah. I mean, and seriously. They don't what, want to believe, you're... they don't want to believe that a frequency can impact them. But everybody's well aware of the fact that you go to a, a rock concert, you go to, and frequency matters a lot. I can, yeah. I can change the way you feel by frequency all day long. I was, that's why I was trying to say, like, it's important for people to understand we, as human beings, our genetic sequence is put together by a specific frequency. Altering that frequency can alter so many things, not just yeah. earthquakes, geological weather, storms, yeah. hurricanes, Robert, your everything. Thoughts, your thoughts are simply an electromagnetic impulse firing through your body right now. If, <laughs> if somebody had the ability to listen to that, to hear it, right? And then if they wanted to hijack that, right? Because we all know how we all know how standard systems work, right? Here's how your radio works. Your radio pulls in a signal from the strongest producer on that frequency, right? Yeah. If Z100 is on the radio, right? But if someone else jumps onto Z100 frequency and starts pumping out at a more powerful frequency, you just simply get the stronger frequency. That's how receivers work. So if the receivers in your body simply get an input signal that matches your previous input signal to that receiver but comes in in a stronger power form, your receivers just simply respond and have no idea that there's a new transmitter. They just... And with transformation of energies frequencies and vibrations there always has to be a grounding a ground guess who is the ground guess awesome what? The earth. smartphones <laughs> smartphones we're we're the ground we're yeah we're the ground that the energy comes through that's why they want us wearing shoes with uh rubber soles on the bottom but Mm -hmm. uh you know uh um... yeah because because god couldn't <laughs> figure out how to make feet <laughs> god came god came so close to perfecting the human if he only realized he was going to place them on the ground at some point we got to put rubber on the bottom of their feet otherwise they're going to get blown away by the frequency but um, you're absolutely right, and unfortunately, it's so easy to manipulate. And not just like physical energy, uh, tones, which are energy and frequency itself, vibrational, but um, the same, these 
these signals that are being sent from Antarctica to other locations around the world. It's carrying yep. tones. And just like yes. you said at a concert, you know, you go to one concert, say it's reggae, a bunch of hippies, peace, love, and happiness. You're like, oh, I feel yep. chill. Then you go to a metal concert. Yes. <laughs> Great example. Great example. You're if like, I, you're, I want to mess stuff up. All yeah. right, let's you, go. Whoa. You would unavoidably, you would unavoidably find yourself aligning to those frequencies if left in that long enough. You would harmonize. That is what is going on on a planetary, galactic, universal yes. scale. Yes. The, the sun. Out, the sun has a frequency. Venus has right? a frequency. Mars, the moon, frequency. We've, we've, we've found out that you can take like classical music, right? Stuff without lyrics, right? And and I could play a, a concerto on a piano for you, and I could say, Robert, you know, what is, what is this song? What's going on in this song? What's what's the story? What's the emotion? And and you'll give me your version, right? And then what we found is that we can go to someone in Japan, we can go to someone in India, we can go to these people all over the world from completely different experiences, and they start telling you the same story about that song. The magic flute, my friend. You know? So I, I believe that there are these frequencies and stuff, and it gets very dangerous when we have technologies at the South Pole Station, because what happens when somebody learns the frequency of confusion and then starts to play it? What if they know the frequency of fear and then starts to transmit it? The world that we're living in right now, my friend. <laughs> exactly. So this is so this is what I'm trying to impress upon people is that this is this isn't fun and games anymore. This isn't sensational conversation anymore. This is brass tax reality. That's I'm gonna just I'll just go right for the if you guys don't care about yourselves, care about the children. They're attacking our children with this. You don't exactly. care about adults? No problem. I don't care about a lot of adults, too. But you know what? When I think about these horrible people and what our children are going to be left with... And the example I, they're setting for them. Ugh. I find most of the people around me to not really be carrying enough weight on this mission. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we can really uh, redirect our efforts... I get that sensational conversations are fun, interesting, but um, in practical application, are they not time sucks? Yeah. Right? We waste our time talking about a lot of these things that we can't do anything about. Yeah. What does it actually do with what's around us? What's the yeah. practical value of being the most informed person on SSP topics? Right? What are you going to do with that? <laughs> uh, oh, guess and, what? I just found out this. I found out that. Did you know this? Draco, that. Repti what? Okay, cool. Now okay. what do you do next? Yeah. Okay, so I heard all that, but guess what? I found out there's technology at the South Pole Station that's working against every person on this planet right now. It's absolutely part of the secret space program since people want to talk secret space program. You know? It's an intergalactic communication device There's not a great well. extraterrestrial operating it doesn't mean that it's nefarious in ways and it can also be positive it, it's a tool it's right? a tool exactly a you're tool. right it is exactly that's the way i look at it it's a, it's a tool and in reality i think a lot of people are going to be frustrated when they find out there's a lot of these types of systems and facilities that are up and running and they basically function day by day to the highest bidder they could be functioning to make our lives truly better Correct. Yeah. Correct. That is switching sides all the time. Eric, my question to you, because you brought up a great thing and moving forward to kind of slowly, you know, come to a conclusion. With this going on, we know this is happening. Do you have any recommendations or tools that we, like the people that are watching this, what can we do? to combat this from here, here your lies wisdom. the problem Robert it's so easy the answer is so easy and no one will do it <laughs> we, we have to get off of the digital addiction we're feeding the beast <laughs> that's hard it's so right? hard I, it's feeding the beast us. I know. That's this we're, is this we're is the, feeding the, it right now I know I know this is the, this is this is the problem is that I know this is it we're we're 
you know, everybody says there's two wolves inside of you, and which one survives is the one that you feed. And here we are talking about a technological monster that's to the detriment it. of humanity, and everybody's getting more and more addicted. So the answer is, ready for this? Do you remember the plank challenge? Remember when everybody was doing that, the plank challenge? Oh, I can plank. I can do it for 30 seconds. I can do it for a minute. I can do it for five minutes. You need to take that challenge and apply it to your cell phone. How long can you go without your cell phone? If that thing rings or the text goes off, how long can you ignore it for? Right, when start you, with that. When you now, sleep, put put your phone in another room. Don't keep yeah, it next to your head. It should not be near you when you're sleeping. S start there. That's easy, yeah, start something there. we all can do. There you go. Start, start somewhere, but not for nothing. Here's the crazy part. <laughs> It has to work up to a lot further than that. I get that's the big I know. steps. But now get yourself to the point of like, about 50 hey, I'm going to go to the grocery store without my phone. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna go out of the house. I'm going to make one trip. I'm going to go out of the house. I'm going to come back. I'll come right back. But I'm going to go to this one place. I'll come back with, and I won't bring my phone. Yeah. And then you got to work your way up to, can you, could you go a whole weekend without your phone? Yeah. And it doesn't help if you go to Walmart or a grocery store because they have all the frequency and technology Understood. there. And these, so. and these are the weird things, right? So this, these are the <laughs> questions that I have. But as, you know, an Alaskan, right, for me it's easy, right, because I go everywhere and lose cell service. So I'm not, I'm not indentured to my phone and technology. There's so many places in the state of Alaska that have no cell service that blows people's minds. They don't get it. But I can, I can. Jersey, I have zero. I have to use Wi-Fi to make phone ah, calls. I live go. in a dead zone here in New there Jersey. Yeah, people don't but, even realize that exists anymore. <laughs> but I, from the energy, the nuclear plant, there's so much energy that's still here. I'm not, I'm not exempt. It's still there. <laughs> you, were, you were born with black hair and your beard's just glowing now, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nuclear radiation, you know? Yeah. Uh, oh, but that's a great point. Baby steps, you know, um, and it's hard because <laughs> we're we're so reliant on technology, and it, it is a tool. But unfortunately, certain people are using it for whatever Absolutely. they see fit. Here's another big concern that I have that I'm trying to impress upon people in the grand scheme of what what can we do? Um, know thyself is going to be a massive mission that everybody's currently failing. I mean, I hate to I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Um, everybody's already become very confused as to who they are. Mm -hmm. And I want to express the State of the Union right now. A few months ago, the McDonald's Corporation put out an article stating very clearly that they're going to be investing money into technology for research and development to be able to put their commercials into your brain while you're sleeping. Oh, wow. Cool. That would so, be nice. <laughs> so, I don't want anybody to think that the McDonald's Corporation is at the forefront of this technology. Yeah. Let's not pretend that if McDonald's is getting it now, that other people haven't been using it for decades. Yeah, by time major companies get something, the same with our technology, the military right. complex had it Correct. 30, 40 years ago. So, Every taking time. that... So taking that reality into this conversation, what you just said, Robert, I agree with. So now what do we do knowing that for 30 or 40 years on this planet existed a technology that allows the insertion of somebody else's thoughts into your head? This is why I say know thyself becomes very important. Because like I said before, your thoughts, your voice is simply an electrical impulse that can be recorded. Yeah. And, and just like we see that AI can take a voice and fake it, we know that this technology, I know that there is technology that exists, that if I had the money, I could assess you, I could get your thought voice, and I could speak into your head in your voice and make you say to you whatever I want. Yeah, because we are telepathic beings that have been taught not to be telepathic that way our telepathy can be manipulated and for everyone right. that's listening you know you said mcdonald's is going to give you big mac commercials when you're sleeping in your dreams it doesn't quite work that way it's a lot more complicated but to give a little example so everyone that's watching this i love simplifying stuff mm -hmm. but imagine every time you heard a mcdonald's commercial 
there was a certain tone or frequency that we don't pick up with our ears. And then our phones and our devices were able to just whoop, put this tone out that our brain associates with the commercial. We would think about the commercial would replay in our brain. That's a very even simple worse. way. Of <laughs> even, even worse and still simple. Back to what I was just saying. What if that commercial plays, right? But because of the technology and your voice, the recording, the automation of the system, because your phone's on your hip, what if when that commercial plays, they automated your voice in your head to go, that sounds good? Oh, no. Like, for example, me talking to myself. Yes, oh, correct. I that's love the, Big yes. Oh, Thank you. That's what I'm getting at. That, in my beard. Robert, that's what I'm getting at, Robert. That's what I'm getting at. It is that that's level actually of technology. Worse that's what I'm you're getting not at. even understanding that's, that it's McDonald's. It's me what that i is, want that is where i'm saying people don't understand why they have to know thyself because it is mm. that level of engagement that they're at now how would that you, you know when that commercial it. comes on right <laughs> when that commercial yeah. comes on already already you have that choice to make hey i'm hungry uh. i have to eat something do i want to get mcdonald's or do i want to get something healthy you already have a debate in your head the the technology is simply adding another voice and controlling the power level of it. So yeah. now what if the other voice in your head says, oh, you totally should get that Big Mac. Well, what if they can just make that voice louder than the other ones? You're getting a Big yeah. Mac. Yeah, this exactly. is now science and technology of mind control. That is simple, available today, mind control. Yeah. And such a great point when it's us when it's us that right. is saying it, it gives yes. another yes. level to it. We're more likely to listen to something if it's our, what we call, inner voice. Our inner voice. Cool. So, now that we've crossed this bridge, Robert, now, look back at the last two years, almost three now. I'm going to say that what I've known of humanity in my entire life experience taught me that there is no way in hell that you got everybody on this planet to agree simultaneously on any goddamn thing, okay? That's true. Let alone, you're telling me that overnight, instantaneously, you got everybody to say, I think it's a great idea for me to wear a mask all day long. Yeah. I don't think anybody was really thinking that themselves. I think I let everybody know that there's a technology that confused them convinced them and in their own voice justified it for them which is what the technology does and the welcome. hillbilly and welcome. rednecks around welcome. Me, they weren't playing it <laughs> welcome to the battlefield of the future the battlefield of the mind yeah we're losing we're totally losing and nobody wants to hear this because like we, you and i have been talking it requires them to do something yeah and right now without getting too sensitive and getting too in touch with everything but a lot of what is going on with the geopolitical theaters certain mm -hmm. countries that we're all being looped into hating those countries even though the people are amazing it's just our government their governments they're all scumbags let's call it for what it is people are wonderful but people mm -hmm. are be being, being Yep. I don't want to say controlled. Uh, it, uh, we're stronger than that. People are we're, being but, but, guided. But we're guided. being manipulated. We're being mind controlled right now. And it, I, I appreciate your, your wanting to be kind to everyone and say this isn't going on. Say it but it's, because I'm a sovereign being. I'm I know. But, the, but, but, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, but it's, also, it's also inappropriate, right, Robert? If you're, if you're in the middle of a bar fight with all of your friends, right? If you're losing that fight, Shouldn't you be honest instead of saying we're winning? So that's why I look at it right now is we're in the throes of battle and we're losing. And I don't want to sugarcoat this for everybody. Unfortunately. Because if, if we do, then there's going to be no victory, right? If you're losing a fight and you're deluding yourself, saying, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we got this. You're not going to win that fight. Yeah. But yeah. if you're losing a fight and you can become aware that you're losing, you have a potential to regroup, to do something. Yeah. To but make this is an like, actual this is, like, change. this is like Sun Tzu's art of war stuff, right? 
if you're gonna if you wanna the best way you could probably destroy your enemy would be in the throes of battle if you're gonna let him think that he's winning the whole time he's losing. Yeah. And uh, I brought this fact up uh, not too long ago in an interview I had with uh, John Yost, great guy. Uh, he made a great film, Alien Abduction Answers. But he said, imagine two people standing at the top of the hill. They have night vision goggles on. They see enemies approaching them, ready to attack them. And the one person gets afraid, and they take the goggles off, and they go, good, no enemies there. I'm good. I'm yes. fine. And the other guy's exactly. like, No! absolutely still coming exactly. and yep. you taking the goggles off is not gonna change what is happening it yep. will just allow you to feel comfortable with yep. what I've is had, happening i put i've put my information out which again brass tax reality we got weapons platforms at the south pole station that are to the detriment of humankind that's real okay and this is on your website right absolutely yep this is my experience my documentation TV. this is this is brass tax real stuff I, I challenge anybody. I've had this information out for three years. Nobody has come at me sideways and said that's not true because they can't. This, this, <laughs> and this is information has been out for three years. Nobody's challenged it because they can't. This is this is Good. reality. Good. Yeah, but what winds up happening is that everything's just getting diluted, like you said. You know, you you bring up the topic and people change the subject. Well, and that's the sidestep that got, I'm trying to figure out how to get extra through with disclosure. Terrestrials. You got to add this. You got to say, Eric, you got to be like, hey, last night I went to Mars and aliens told me that if we don't shut down these systems in Antarctica, all of humanity's going. Oh, and then you would blow up overnight. But if you well, tell but, people the facts and the truth yeah. of your experiences, overlooked every time absolutely and what winds up happening is i'm putting my information out there and i'm i'm having these folks that have the sensational tales um respond to my information and they say well i channeled and someone told me that all the bad stuff in antarctica was shut down and the white hats are victorious now and it's like <laughs> what okay i <laughs> okay what? That's what you I know. Said. Oh, so, okay. so, yeah, I mean, but this is what's going on in the community. And then people, people hear that, right? And I get, I get the way human nature works. This is exactly, this is a tactic that's going to undermine my position, right? A, a so, false enemy and ignore the real one. That is and humanity. Their story is peaches <laughs> and cream because their <laughs> story is they already won. The white hats won. So now everybody goes, well, we don't have to listen to Eric because Eric's trying to make us do something. And we don't need to do anything because the other person said that Eric's wrong, that the white hat stopped the bad stuff. Yeah. So this is the shenanigans that I'm trying to figure out how to get through this. I, I feel like I'm on the shores of one country and I have truth that I need to bring to safe harbor in another yeah. country. But in between, there's just this sea of lies that I have to try to figure out how to navigate. And all of these liars and all these people that act like they're trying to help you cross over when they're here for your demise. They're trying to sink your ship. Yeah, exactly. And to tell someone there is, as you going back to what you said, if you saw me at a bar and someone was about to clock me out, you would have to say something yeah robert what, do what, something what, what yeah what what they're doing they're they're not warning people about they're telling you just sit there everything's all right just keep keep the goggles off keep oh, the yeah. goggles uh, off everything oddly fine. enough oddly enough most people get frustrated with me because when i tell them the truth they then get mad because i won't yeah. tell them exactly what to do yeah which in reality it's like listen the whole thing you should be doing to begin with is doing what you want to do and not what other people tell you. I mean, literally yeah. what I'm warning them of is a control mechanism that's taking their freedom away and what they're begging for is for someone to tell them what to do again still. It's like, listen, exactly. stop doing that. The, the whole, the the whole point of this pattern. is, yeah, like whatever you want to do as an individual is what I'm expecting you to start doing. Stop doing the thing that you're being commanded to do by any definition. I don't want you to do what I tell you either. Okay. I want people exactly. to learn that they're currently operating under the control mechanisms of someone else. 
Yeah. Not Don't me. listen to Not me. Not them. Yeah. <laughs> Learn to know thyself. Because if you start doing what I say and what I do, then you're just operating as me and not you. And be careful within yourself because of what you just said. They have ways of making us think we are telling ourselves. Exactly. So we even have to second guess ourself and look yes. even deeper within. These deeper. are what the mystery schools of old were teaching everybody. Over the over the holes of the mystery schools was carved into stone. Know thyself. And Absolutely. it was because in antiquity, uh, there were magicians, let's just say, that wielded these techniques techniques that could do the same thing mathematics so way back when Math they had magicians to, right they had to know thyself back then because a human being could have walked up and put a thought in your head huh. by technique nowadays we just have technology that's bastardizing techniques of old but each of the individuals are still empowered to know thyself and filter out any intrusive thoughts that aren't your own yeah exploiting the esoteric like That's... i was saying earlier with my my submarine experiences right i know myself and i know that i don't have a learning issue so mm -hmm. i know that that thought block that memory block that i have in the navy i know is not me it doesn't fit yeah it doesn't it... fit any of my other memories and I know it's been I know it's foreign info. And you've been in a lot of other situations, such as the totally. incident when you were in Antarctica running towards a place on fire that had, you know, all those tanks in there, helium tanks, like you know, you've been in other situations and something, you know, I wanted to bring up about, you know, what you were saying about like all of this in general is you know it really does come down to us and more so than that but you know i want everyone to know you're not a fear monger and you do talk about things in a more um professional as light-hearted as you possibly can be about talking about these things because there is doom and gloom fear mongers and they're just adding fuel to the fire Right. Those are more. Those folks are more cynical. The folks that like are. are I get that. There, there are folks that are negative. Like there's no hope. Oh, I'm. Yeah. I'm not no hope. But I'm also you, not sugarcoating reality. We're in a. We're in a bad spot of which yeah. I am not doom and gloom. I am very. Um, we can kick ass and take names. That's my angle. You believe but, we can change it? We just need I know we to can. know how. And you're trying to provide yes. ways yes. on how to break the system. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Not just complain about it, but no, 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 do no, no, something no. about it. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to educate myself on these technologies, learn more and more about what we can do about it. I mean, the, the, the doing that I'm doing, first and foremost, is bringing this to the world's attention. Um, yeah. My crew, okay, um, from the South Pole Station, my winter over crew, has been negatively impacted by these weapons platforms. Um, you'll see in the news people talking about Havana syndrome and the symptoms um, yeah. that go with that. These are this is from weapons of war known as directed energy weapons. This is just the new modern battlefield that we're all in. My crew was negatively impacted. So to me, this is like, in a way, sorry if people get offended by this, um, but it's like I was involved with the team that went to war. We just didn't know it. We were operating a weapons system that went operational and offensive, and no one told us. I believe that whatever we were firing upon fired back. I Unknowingly. My, I believe my crew is walking wounded with wounds that nobody will discuss the weapons of which inflicted them. Exactly. And if but, it happened to you and your team, the question we should all be saying right now, who else? Correct. I honestly don't want to know the answer because I kind of It's do. all of us. It's, it's all, all of us. us. That's, that's, you're right, because what I'm trying to impress upon people now is I am now seeing going on about me in everyone. Mm -hmm. The things that I know were problematic for a small group of people that I was around previously. And I know what became of them. And it's trickling out to a world population scale. Correct. So to speak. Wow. Correct. And um, 
Yeah, so mind blowing. And I know it's just the tip of the, you know, iceberg. <laughs> no yes. pun intended. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but I definitely want to have you back on. I know we went for a good two hours or so, but I, you know, a lot of people have you on to talk about Antarctica, to talk about each little thing, but I wanted it all and I wanted your life journey because it really helps understand and we didn't even get to you in uh, alaska and some of the crazy stuff you've been involved so we'll say that for oh, part two we'll, no problem and it's just getting yeah. crazier up here by the day with all the ufos getting shot down <laughs> boy oh norad is working overtime boy. <laughs> uh, even yeah. canada's finally doing something. hey just, just, as a, just just as a tidbit of info um, some truth coming straight from the source up here in Alaska. Um, that first one that was shot down in Alaska, not the Canadian one, so the, the, the one that I believe they said was one reported. Size of the car, yada, yada, yeah, yada. Yeah, I believe they said that it was reported on Thursday, shot down on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. And that was the story about the interference with the airspace and blah, blah, blah. I'm getting um, uh, reports from folks up local, okay, within 30 miles of the crash site. They were saying, that uh, flight operations were shut down since Monday. Shut down since Monday. Hold on, no, they were shut down since Monday okay. prior to the shooting. So there was a lie in there. When they were oh. saying that they found it on Thursday and shot it down Friday, is not true because flight ops were shut down from the prior Monday. Why were they shut down? Prior Monday. Tuesday, Monday. Wednesday, the prior Monday, flight ops were shut down. It's so much. So much hey. bullshit going on. And we know we know there's UFOs, but at what point will they will they flood these, us with the idea? These are not of UFOs that they're that, shooting right now. They're not. Currently, no, they're not. But they're UFOs. pitching it. They're pitching it like that. They're we hitting, know they're right, not. Right. They're, they're not, Israel they're, they're, drones, China right, drones, they're, they're, Russian they're, drones. They're, they're Earth. They're Earth-made items, um, or we wouldn't be shooting them with conventional weapons. Drones and little spear right. balls that are floating yeah. around. We a lot when of we us. Start, got when up. we start fighting aliens, we will be using non-conventional weapons. Yeah. If they're gonna, if they're taking stuff out with sidewinder missiles, it's man-made. It's not yeah. Stuff. If you see giant beams of microwave shoot and light spectrums that you've never seen before shooting up towards the sky, that's when you know we're dealing with. Yeah. Other. Yeah, it'll be it'll be more like sound beams and things like that. Yeah, frequency weapons, directed energy weapons. Those things will be fighting aliens when it's legit. Some of the things that will come out of some of the testing of things that you were working on down in Antarctica. And the exactly. same things it's... that are being worked on. You know, it's not just a, how can we use this on people. It's military complex. Rule number one. How can we make it a weapon? How can we make it the most efficient weapon? After we figure it out, let's package it up into technology and give it to the public. But first, we must learn how to control it so we can monitor all those in the public that use it. Yep. Yeah, and then they'll and then they'll say something to the effect of, and we need to do all of this, you know, because we might have three hundred million people out there, uh, but one of them might be a terrorist, so we need to take away the rights of the three hundred million so that we can watch that one. National security has been the lamest excuse. We don't have any national. There's no such thing as national security. It doesn't exist, There's and no, it's been the. That's why my family suffered. You know the big the scam of TSA. National, <laughs> TSA is such a joke, right? So the TSA yeah. is supposed to protect the airport, right? So that a terrorist can't get where the planes are, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it takes to get onto the tarmac at an airport? Go you know through a little fence. You, know you know what keeps you out of an airport? Not having an airplane. Yeah, exactly. Do you know if you buy an airplane, they can't keep you out of the airport, right? So. Basically, we have this whole TSA thing, right? And everybody thinks like, oh, look, the terrorists can't get to the planes now. Or, or they can just go buy a plane, right? Because here's, here's how the airport works, folks, in case you didn't realize that. I've been in a lot of planes up here in Alaska, right? So you jump in the plane with the pilot, right? And he literally rolls over to the airport and there's a gate that's locked and it's automatic. Literally, it's just automatic. And there's a button on your plane. It's how planes and airports work. And you hit this button the gate opens and you're now so easy 
as long as you're if you're a pilot, right? So if you can buy a plane, right? You buy a plane. Eh? I got a plane. Now you hit the button and you roll right in. That's how you get through security at any airport. So if it yeah, turns that- out, if it turns out that the terrorists might ever be able to purchase a plane, yeah, and figure right. this out, they might be able to get completely around the entire TSA. Yeah. I really the hope good news no is one like that probably is watching this. Figured this out yet? Well, otherwise, you just told them all. Otherwise, we'd be wasting all of our TSA money up until this point. <laughs> nice, nice joke there. But uh, <laughs> if they didn't know, unfortunately, you just told them, and uh, hopefully, uh, they won't. But there, when there's a will, there's a way. It don't matter yeah. what it is. It's it's everything. Uh, but good, good yeah, thing Eric. No such thing as terrorism, and it's just a CIA scam. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, we're just joking, everyone. You don't take my channel down. We, we love you, CIA. Oh, big hearts. Love there. That, that oh, I'm, just making, the I'm just making sure they're still listening. <laughs> but, um, yeah, thank you so much, Eric. And I know this is, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. So much more. And I hope to have you on next time to talk more about Alaska and to get a little bit more into some of the other things you learned along the way and going more into details but i'm just thankful that everyone got to hear the overall story your upbringing what you've done different things you encountered and a lot of those childhood experiences i've heard a lot of other people while they were in school they were doing some weird weird programs and things like that that they didn't quite understand so that's really relatable um, although they probably weren't in those projects, but there is some sort of bigger thing going on where they're doing a lot of different versions of this. And I know a lot of us have some sort of um, connection. Like we said earlier, they're watching all the kids. No, no one's excluded. You know, they may ignore ones. They don't feel that will be useful, but they're looking for all. I think of it like the military in a way, right? When yeah. You go join the Scouting. military. I mean, you might wind up becoming a, a you know a heart surgeon for the military, or you might wind up just sweeping floors. But either way, they're going to take you and they're going to put you to task. I kind of feel like that's what they're doing Perfect. with the kids: is that there's a process that filters them into the appropriate control role. program. But I don't think. I, yeah, the role. I, they'll, they'll find a role for you. You'll fill the role, and you'll be under control. But it's it's by their definition, unfortunately. I'm not supporting this system. I wanna I wanna rip out the foundations of it. I'm just observing that this seems to be the reality that we're in. Is I don't think any kid gets out unscathed. It's just yeah. a matter of what process you went through and what pen did they stick you in on the farm. Yeah, and it's our time to choose our role. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. And, and absolutely that's easier said than done. Agree. Oh, I so agree. But I'm I'm here for this fight. That's what I'm here for. It's like I don't want to be doom and gloom, like you said before. I don't want to be doom and gloom, like oh, we're trapped on the board. No, 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 no. I just want. Yeah, not that. It's not that at all. I'm I'm very happy to say, hey, Robert, you know, this place sucks and we're trapped on the farm, but we got to come up with a plan. Like I'm not saying like. Not a chance. Yeah, hell to get yeah. up out of it. <laughs> we we only we only have a chance when we admit the problem. Straight okay. up, I mean that's, that's that's the issue, right? We have we have no chance if we don't admit this problem. We have every chance if we all just work together and attack the problem. When I was in the submarine service, there was a term that they threw around all the time. They say, "You mess up, you fess up, we fix it." Oh, yeah, exactly. That's what we need to do as a people. We messed up. We need to fess up. We need to fix it. Yep. That's it. And it's it's very important to, you know, one last little final word, you know. I know a lot of us are very, you know, about ETs and angels and demons and invisible enemies. But believe me when I say I've seen true evil on this planet. And it's always been a homo sapien. You know, and we need to recognize before we start making imaginary, invisible bad guys 
or even the actual ones that are here, at the end of the day, human beings are some of the most dangerous extraterrestrials in the universe because yep. of their lack of knowledge and misunderstandings and fear and emotion. Yep. So let's, um, let's clean our own house first. Let's clean our house. And that is something we all can do by just, like we said, helping those around us and being more uh, conscious and aware of our phones. Like we said, you know, like maybe take our phones and put them out in our cars 50 feet away when we sleep. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. the next room over is not enough. But start wherever you can. Whatever's comfortable. Let's try to be more human with each other. I think that's a good position to operate from. If we can be more human every day, we'll be going in the right direction. Yeah, go out and on a hike in nature with a friend. Leave yep. your cell phones behind. Oh, Enjoy yeah. It. Be bold. Yep. Yeah. Go on a bold adventure with your friend without cell phones and see how long you can survive. Call it rough again. <laughs> uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, great point. But, man, this has been a pleasure. I really want to yeah, have you Robert, back thank on. Thank you so much. I would love to. This is great. Yeah. And thank you for, uh, you know, your your service, you know, the, the studies and the things you've done. Although I know some of it was questionable, you still have done quite a bit throughout your life and you're still doing things in service to humanity and helping certain things stay afloat and you know making sure people are taken care of and the responsibilities that come from that really appreciate that and what you're doing for humanity and trying to let people know like once again I don't have all the answers but this is what I know exists and this is real this needs to be of concern and people should at least meditate and think about it for a little tiny bit mm -hmm. not fear mongering just take it in we know it's not as fantastical as these space travels and all that but <laughs> it's there and uh it is what it is and just try to meditate on it everyone so please, everyone, make sure you go in the description. You will be able to find Eric's information, Deciphering TV, his YouTube channel as well, and all that good stuff. Make sure you check him out. He has a lot of great videos. He's done stuff, I believe, with Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, Tony Rodriguez, so many other people in the community, a lot of people that all of you know. Uh, please give this video a big thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button and share it. And we will see you next time. And hopefully we'll have a part two I'm looking forward to. So have a good night, everyone. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Yep. Throw your cell phones away. We're out of here. <laughs> I didn't want to go public without evidence because I knew no one would believe me. The entire incident happened about five to six minutes in total. My mom shouts really loud, Oh my God, what is that? What is that? At no point did the two men in black or the Air Force gentleman ask my mother or her friends what did they see. They looked human, but they did weird things. The men in black, they said, You will report it as a helicopter crash. Or, we will take your son away. The men in black play the narrative and the media outlets skew it back out. This was 1991 Project Mockingbird in full effect.
join the YouTube membership for my channel, you will get exclusive badges, really awesome emojis, member only live streams, posts, and chats, and connections with me for only $5.99 a month. See you there. Hey everyone, check out the Order of Light merchandise store. We got a lot of different t-shirts there. The humans aren't real. Lower Always Creek incident. We got tank tops and Merkaba. We got stickers, glasses, a lot of different glasses. So get thirsty. We got bags. I live in New Jersey. We don't have bags anymore. So it's really nice. We got flip-flops, hoodies, and all the ladies out there. We got a bunch of awesome merchandise for you.